Sen bir gaz gereken dedi. Gotta be some little kitty here. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Hi. Welcome to the Catella Bubble. I know it's been a long time. Okay. I know. Since the last part of this review of Spare by Prince Harry. But if you look on the bright side, that means that there has been a lot more tea that has been spilled since this book came out. Boston Tea Party levels of tea are gonna be spilled coming after this, which makes this part of the book a lot juicier and a lot more intriguing. So if you think about it, maybe it was a good idea that I put off this part of the book because there is a lot more context we can now put into what Harry is saying, which might make this a little bit more fun. We'll see. And this part, I'm going to be honest, when I first read this part of the book, I kind of felt like this was the weakest part plot wise, which I would say is to be expected from a memoir because obviously the last part of the book is in a memoir typically going to be the closest to the present and there's only so much reflection you can do on your present moment right there's only so much introspection and deep thought that you can put into events that happened like six years ago and it's a memoir as well right so there's not going to be a lot of like resolution to things that are situations that are still ongoing, right? And this memoir has been released like months before big parts of what's gonna be Harry's ultimate story have yet to unfold, like the coronation, the lawsuits, etc. So there's huge chunks of the book that are sort of unresolved and it's weird to be in a space where they might get resolved relatively soon. But again, Harry has a long life to live. So of course we're not gonna fully be able to understand everything about what this book means until Harry is lived out the rest of his life. So the point is that I, I felt like this part of the book the first time around, it just didn't read like we got as many tidbits of information, as many anecdotes as we did in some of the previous sections. A lot of stuff, maybe the lawyers got involved a little bit more in this section. Maybe there's just a lot of stuff that's so fresh that they don't want to share yet because it's part of ongoing discussions with the royal family or with the lawsuits that are happening. I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of parts of the section plot wise that are missing from the story. The quality of the writing though, again, is still very high. Everything about this sort of style, I really like the way things are phrased. I don't think that anybody should be required to share or not share whatever it is about their own life. So I totally respect that decision. Again, it can make the memoir feel a little bit unsatisfying if you're here for like, I want to know who are the rats in the system? Like, but again, one of the bonuses of doing this part of the review so much later on is that some gaps, like I said, have been somewhat filled in since the book has come out and hopefully I can interweave some of the things that have transpired that will help understand this part a little bit more. I'll add those in as we go through the book because man, I'm, there's a lot. Uh, I... <sighs> I don't know. So that being said, even though there's not as many anecdotes in this part of the book, I will say that some of the anecdotes that we do get in this part of the book are just jaw dropping. <laughs> Literally just amazing, amazing, crazy. So yeah, like this part of the book is also like great if you love like all the drama and stuff. And it also just has like some excellent like scene painting scenes that go on in this part that I'm like, oh God, it's, it just, it really brings home the fact that these people are human. And I know that's the one thing that they don't want you to think about, but these people are so human. And so, oh, they're, 
there are some scenes that I just love. I'm so excited. These parts just fill me with joy, which is pretty apt because this is the part of the book where joy comes into Harry's life because this is the part where he meets Megan. Oh, very cute. Honestly, the frostbitten penis part of the book, like that's got nothing on this in terms of embarrassment because it's so gushingly lovey-dovey, beautiful, cutesy. It's so embarrassing in some ways, this part of the book, how sort of cutesy and in love he is. Honestly, it's like sickly sweet at some points. Like, I, again, I would be much more embarrassed of this part of the book than the frostbitten penis part. That part actually sounded like fucking cool, badass, like going up to the North Pole. This is like, some of these parts, I love it. I'm a I'm a hopeless romantic too. I love the cutesiness. I've been there. I I get you. But some of this is like, oh, this, oh, it's cringe. It's really cringe. It makes me think of like high school. <laughs> it's like high school. I should say it's like my high school experience. Just just how like just how embarrassing it is. But again, it's cute. It's cute. I love it. Okay, it's spoiler time. It's spoiler time. Let's go. Let's go. Let's dive in. We gotta keep. We gotta keep it moving. You know, I could sit here for hours. So chapter one, how did Harry meet Megan in the first place? So Harry was scrolling through his like Snapchat or something. And one of his friends posted a picture of Meghan Markle with like a little dog Snapchat filter on. I was scrolling through my feed and uh, someone who was a friend had this video of the two of them, it was like a Snapchat. Oh, gosh. Um, Isn't that whole thing? It started like dog ears. The dog, and, dog ears. And That's what he saw of me. That was the first thing. I was like, who is that? <laughs> this is ridiculous. And Harry says that he was just overtaken with how beautiful and cute she looked in this photo and that he just stopped in it, dead in his tracks when he saw her. He literally says... I realized I didn't want to die. I wanted to live. Again, like I said, this is a little cringe. It's a little, but listen, I get it. I get it, but it is a little, oh, it's so cute. But he just describes it as like, as somebody that has been all over the world, met so many gorgeous, beautiful people as a celebrity, that she sort of put that whole conveyor belt of women that were in and out of his life on a halt. That she was just that sort of stunningly beautiful and that just something about like the way her personality sort of shone through the the picture that it, that it shone through. Should I say it British or American? Shone, it shone through, it shone through. Pick, take your pick, okay? But there was just something in her picture that like, he said made her seem confident, free. That she was just seemed like so carefree and had like a po very positive attitude. So his friend Violet, who's Instagram or whatever this is, he texts her, he's like, who is this lady? She's gorgeous. Violet's like, oh yeah, tons of guys have been asking that. So again, Megan must have been like a hot date. She says she's on this TV show called Suits. Finally, they're able to get connected through this friend. And then she sent me an email saying, I know you said you're single and a friend of mine asked about you and maybe you'd like to meet him. And I said, who is it? And she said, it's Prince Has. And I said, who's that? And he starts sort of like scrolling through her Instagram. We know from the Harry and Meghan documentary, she also kind of scrolled through his Instagram. They're finst finstas, they've got finstas, okay. And his finsta is like all his pictures of Botswana and all his work in Africa. He also notices that she also has basically the same sort of finsta. She's got all of her charity work in Africa, all of her travels. And it's amazing again, even before or they've met, they have all of these similarities, all these things in common, right? That they're drawn to this charity work, that they're drawn to Africa. So right off the bat, we're seeing that they're instantly looking at each other and thinking, oh, wow, we're, we already have all of these things that are similar. And I think that the reason why Harry kind of talks about this so much in the book is I think it really helps to make 100% clear why they are so 
in love with each other, why they're so committed to each other. This also is kind of reminiscent about how the Harry and Meghan documentary starts off, which is also very much about setting the scene for their love story, for how they met, how they got together, why it just came together so fast and why they fell in love so fast and, and how they know that this is right for them and the, the family that they wanna build together, the life that they wanna build together. I think that's such a big part of the story because I think if that's not something that you get hooked onto, then it's easy to start making all the accusations about, well, Harry's manipulating him or she's power hungry, she's greedy, or he's weak and he's, you know, I don't know, pussy whipped or whatever sort of like stereotypes people have about what this relationship is. And again, we can get into like, there's sexism involved in that, there's racism involved in that, right? But that's something that the press goes after a lot in these subtle ways is basically saying, well, they're not really in love. This isn't real. This relationship isn't real. There's some sort of nefarious intent. There's some sort of fakeness to the whole thing, something is false. And based on the emphasis of it here in the memoir and the emphasis of it in the documentary, I think that's something that they really wanna make clear. They just know in their bones that this is like the right choice for them. The, they have so much in common and their perspective on the world is so similar. And good for them, good for them, you know? I'm happy for them. Why can't other people be happy for them? I don't get it. So since they have each other's Instagram, they're they're constantly texting each other. Harry literally says, I couldn't type fast enough. My thumbs were cramping. They're just constantly talking. The, the conversation never stops. So relatable. If anyone's ever been in that cutesy honeymoon phase of love, you're constantly just typing back and forth, you know, constantly wanting to check in on each other. It's really great. And I, I think he sums it up really well when he says, the contradictions created a sense of, hey, I know you, but also I need to know you. Hey, I've known you forever, but also I've been searching for you forever. Hey, thank God you've arrived. But also what took you so long? I think that really sums up all those feelings that you have when you find someone that's a match for you or, or that you build a strong connection with, even if it's not a romantic connection, but like that feeling of like, oh my God, like you're everything, but like, I, I wanna get to know you, but I feel like I know so much about you, but and the ease and the and the energy that comes from that kind of connection and and like he says all the contradictions that come from that you feel all these different emotions all at once it's really cute and he also notes that this conversation took place on his mother's 55th birthday he's starting to like believe in the universe and all of these the supernatural i guess and and how megan is so like closely tied to his mother in these ways that are both sort of like coincidences, but also her energy and her spirit, which we'll kind of get into more later. At the end of the chapter, we also see them setting up their first date and Harry suggests meeting at his place. And she's like, no. <laughs> yeah, he invites her over for a first date and she's like, no, why would I go to your, how, why would I go to your place for, for a first date? And he's like, no, I didn't mean it like that. For him, he has to offer that because again, he's Prince Harry, he can't go out. Like he can't just go pop by and meet someone on a first date in a coffee shop or whatever. Like the pops will automatically be on that story and ruin their lives. And maybe Megan doesn't really understand that at this point in their relationship, but he certainly has that in the back of his mind. I can't meet you in public like that. I can't be seen with you because it's instantly going to destroy our whole relationship. He writes, she didn't realize that being royal meant being radioactive, that I was unable to just meet at a coffee shop or a pub. So he kind of tries to somewhat explain this to her in the moment where he kind of says, yeah, well, we can't really be seen together and blah, blah, blah. 
but he doesn't really do very well with that. And so she says, okay, let's meet at this place. And she's like, well, we're gonna go into like a private room and so it should be okay. Probably a big risk still that Harry probably didn't wanna make at the time, but he's like, this girl's hot, let's do it. It also shows, I think the first chapter does a really good job of showing that instant connection on the sort of human level, their interests, their ambitions, but that there's also this sort of growing niggling thing in the back of their minds, right? Or at least in the back of Harry's mind, there's this little thing that's sort of gonna slowly crop up in the relationship, which is about the big disconnect between their actual lives and situations. I think it will explain a little bit better why Harry wasn't really sure how to prepare Meghan for entering the royal family and why Megan didn't really know necessarily what she was getting into by being in the royal family. And we'll kind of see how that problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger because there's so much misunderstanding, I guess, or some a lot of culture clash for, between like the royal family and what Megan is used to in the celebrity world because they both exist in a celebrity sphere but I don't think Megan fully re understood how different that is to be a celebrity that's also like taxpayer funded and stocked by the pops and all that stuff. And Harry doesn't, I think, fully understand like what it means to be like a normal person. He has like some understanding of that. He's a little bit more well-adjusted than the rest of the family, but he still has a long way to go in terms of understanding how the rest of the world operates. And I think this scene shows that very well, and we're gonna see little scenes like that happening throughout the rest of the book as well. And I think that that's a really big part of the story that I think that he communicates really well in the book. And that's the end of the first chapter. Again, I think these first chapters of each part have been very good at setting up what the theme of the whole part, I think this one, does a very good job of illustrating the intense love and support that Harry and Meghan have for each other, which is also going to conflict with Harry's duties and responsibilities as a royal family member and how they don't fully understand how it's all gonna work out, but that they have the love and connection that human beings just naturally wanna gravitate towards to feel seen and loved and accepted and it's gonna lead to a lot of problems, but at the end of the day, you wanna, you love who you love and you do what you're gonna do. Chapter two, Harry pees his pants, and I will give no more context for that. Read the book. <laughs> Chapter three. So this is where he's actually going to the first date. He gets stuck in traffic. This d disconnect between what a regular person would do in this moment when they're late for a first date and what Harry has to do shows how his royal life is interfering with being a normal person. He's late to their first date, but because he's stuck in traffic in a car, a normal person could maybe jump out of the car, start running down the street. Harry can't do that. He's a celebrity, <laughs> not just a celebrity, but a celebrity who, who apparently is allowed to be stalked and harassed. So he can't just be running down the high street in London without getting papped. And if he did that, they would follow him to his first date. He talks about how he also can't really explain this to Meghan in text form, how much security Harry requires and how much sort of peril they would be in if they were discovered. Which again, maybe that's Harry's fault for not being able to fully communicate that, but it's also a lot to ask someone on a first date to be like, Ugh, like word vomiting all these security concerns concerns and all of these paparazzi concerns and the media and stuff. It's a lot to put out there. And Megan's coming from a world of celebrity in which, okay, if two celebrities get together and they get papped or whatever, it goes on a tabloid for a day, someone maybe writes it up, that's over. But this is like, if Harry is seen with anyone, the British media is like, is this the new future royal family member? Is this woman going to make it in the, in the royal family? Is this lady a commoner? Like, who is this woman? From a first date onward, 
that's going to be the whole story. It's like, oh my God, this woman could be part of the royal family. And so it, it's a completely different sort of tabloid culture. And so I think that kind of shows a little bit of the culture clash that they have. He finally gets in there. He kind of says like, she just seems like very stylish, which kind of makes sense. He doesn't go into it really here, but she was a fashion blogger, I believe. And he says in person, she was even more beautiful, heart attack beautiful. Bleh. He also says she had several careers, lifestyle writer, travel writer, corporate spokesperson, entrepreneur, activist, model. She'd been all over the world, lived in various countries, worked for the US embassy in Argentina. Her CV was dizzying. Think, think in Harry's perspective for, for a moment, okay? Harry has had like two girlfriends that kind of represent two sides of the coin of royal family membership, right? He's had relationships where he's been like head over heels in love, hopeless romantic, that instant human connection, but he knows that this person might not be ready for the media attention and the spotlight and doing all this charity work and would have to drastically change who they were to fulfill that role. And on the other hand, he has dated people that can perform that function that come from that sort of upper crust sort of ribbon cutting lifestyle, but maybe they don't have that human connection. And I think this scene illustrates that instantly Harry is thinking, I've got both here, right? In this lady. I've got a lady that's gorgeous, beautiful, just so poised, so chic, so elegant, and has this amazing career and has already spent so much of her time dedicated to charity, dedicated to being a businesswoman, being successful, trying to do good in the world. And so I think in his mind, he's like, I found the perfect package. What? What else could my family or the British public want? They have a lovely date. She's got to run though. He was late. He didn't get as much time as he really wanted with her. So on to chapter four, Harry comes back from this date. He's going to meet with his friend and he's like, don't talk about her. Don't talk about her. Don't talk about her. And of course he's just, he can't. He can't, he's so excited. His friend is like so excited for him and he instantly whips out the smokes, the drinks. They're gonna watch Inside Out. Harry makes the joke, obviously this movie is all about learning about your emotions, getting in touch with your emotions. Harry is going through that journey, not only by meeting Megan, but also on his own, he's been going on this journey about getting in touch with himself, learning about himself, meditating more, therapy, right? It's it's really funny that this scene is, I think, the real, it's the real story, but I think it also has a very interesting symbolic meaning. And while they're in the middle of watching Inside Out, Megan calls him and she basically says, oh, I just wanted to make sure you understood. Like I I did really appreciate our, our date. I really did enjoy it. I didn't want you to think that I didn't enjoy it because I ran out. They stay up and talk to each other for a little bit longer and they set their second date and they schedule it for the next day. So chapter five, the second date. So Harry says that he brought some cupcakes for the 4th of July to present to Megan as a little token. He of course notes the irony of it all, right? That he is providing her Independence Day cupcakes to represent the independence from the British monarchy. <laughs> they return back to the same restaurant. It sounds like instantly the affection is turned up. He mentions that they kissed on this date. They seem just head over heels like, I wanna jump your bones sort of vibes. In the end, part of me is like, oh my God, this is so cringe. This feels no high school. But at the end, Megan turns to, turns to him. They're like all snuggled up. And it says that she said, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? I'm sorry, I don't wanna make fun of them too much, but it's so cute. It's so, uh, oh, I don't, oh, it's too cringe for me. It's too cringe. But what she means there is like, well, what are we gonna do? Because we live in two separate countries and we're clearly like head over heels in love with each other. And how are we gonna make this work? Like, how, how are we gonna do this? 
and he's basically like, well, we have to, we have to try, right? Like clearly this, there's connection here. This, I mean, this is, this is clearly working. So he's basically like, well, we've got to find a way to meet during the summer. But Megan has like this whole summer booked of like adventures and wild, crazy things. And clearly like Harry feels like very almost like overwhelmed by her. I mean, again, think about this. Like here, here's the way that I find that this book is really good at turning everything on its head, right? Harry is a prince. Harry, literally people think that Harry, like everything his heart desires, everything he ever wants to see, anything he ever wants to do, he could do because he has just this immense wealth and power. But Harry is like not very well read, not very well traveled. More, more more so than the average person, but he is not, like Megan is more sort of like exposed to the whole world than Harry actually is. Harry is a very sheltered person, even though he has this immense wealth and privilege, whereas she's the one that he says, like she was cultured, like she went out and explored and she she's like planning to do like a whole eat, pray, love for herself, you know? And he's never really had that kind of experience. He's had these like few instances where he goes to say Botswana, for example, or the North Pole, but he's not like constantly traveling around and discovering himself and like reading up and look, going to art galleries and stuff. That's not really his thing, but it's so interesting. You would think that he would be this very educated, very cultured person because he had all this privilege, but Again, we've talked about how the upper classes, they don't actually have very good education. They're not actually very well rounded in their education or in their culture. They're trapped in a very, very small world, right? So it, it's very interesting. I like that they're constantly contrasting that Megan is actually like a much more powerful person than, than Harry in a lot of ways. Not like powerful, like controlling, powerful as in like knows herself, knows the world, studies, travels, that kind of stuff. Trying to plan how they're gonna meet up in the summer. Megan says that her friend told her, she said, leave room for magic, let, let some spontaneity take over. It turns out that this one week of magic matches up perfectly with one week that Harry has open during the summer. So it's again, the serendipity, this sort of, again, connection to this like, is it spiritual? Is it fate? Is it some sort of cosmic interference? And we're seeing Harry gets into this like more woo woo spiritual stuff too. And it sounds like maybe Megan has a little bit of that in her too. I think it's just getting closer to this idea of like it's fate, it was destiny. Harry suggests that for that week, they could go to Botswana together. And he actually mentions, he says it's like the place where he feels close to magic. And so he makes that connection of like, this is a magical serendipitous situation and he wants to bring a little bit of the magic that he's experienced to her so very cute lovely they both say okay to it chapter six so they do go to Botswana together he says again they can't be seen flying there together or going together so he arranges for Teej and Mike basically to pick her up he would fly in earlier she would get picked up and brought over to where they would stay she mentions to Harry that on the plane all of the flight attendants and crew members were really into suits. And so they all took a picture together. And Megan tells this story is like, haha, it's really funny. Harry instantly panics. He thinks, oh my God, if anybody gave that photo to the media, this would all be all over the front pages. He's always that person that is thinking about what, what happens once we get discovered? What happens when the media gets on this? And he hasn't fully relayed the consequences of that to Megan, I think. And she doesn't fully understand it. Again, I don't think to her, she thinks, oh, if anybody knew about us or if anyone takes a photo of us, all this horrible shit is gonna happen. Every relationship that I had within a matter of weeks or months was splattered all over the newspapers and that person's family harassed and their lives turned upside down. So, you know, I mean, after one or two girlfriends, the third or fourth girlfriend, you know, they're like, hang on a second. I don't know if I want this. So when I got to meet M, I was terrified of her being driven away by the media, the same media that had driven so many other people away from me.
that's not how the type of celebrity that she's in works, right? That's, you know, if you learn that, you know, this celebrity and that celebrity get together, you know, it's not like suddenly their whole relationship is ruined forever because they're gonna get stalked and harassed for the rest of their life. It just shows again, like how the whole media circus around the royal family really affects their ability to live a normal life. It's so complicated the way that they have to navigate their relationships with people. It sounds exhausting, really. They go off into the wilderness of Botswana. They see all the beautiful animals, giraffes, elephants, lions. By the end of the chapter, though, we kind of get to, again, they're kind of hit by a little bit of a reality check, which is that, like, they're now in a tent together in the middle of nowhere Botswana for like a week and they kind of don't really know each other like that like they kind of committed to like some intense bonding like imagine going on like a camping trip with somebody that you like barely know it was a big commitment I think he talks about how he was kind of stereotyping a little bit thinking that she was this like American actress diva type. And he was thinking, oh, hey. she's gonna open up the suitcase and all her hair products are gonna come out. The makeup's gonna come out, all this stuff. And he sort of like has this stereotype in his mind about what an American actress sort of diva is like. He says like, oh, and then I was surprised. She just packed the essentials. She's not into sort of all that sort of material stuff, which again, I think is something Harry is kind of attracted to because I think that he sees that sort of vanity and stuff. I think he associates it too much with the sort of like publicity and the cameras and stuff of his sort of like royal duties. They hang out, Teach and Mike, having a great time. At the end, while well, they're in their tent together, and he says specifically, if she had been expecting some glamping trip, she was now fully divested of that fantasy. I think he put that in there to specifically say like, there's a lot of accusations I think people have that Megan was like a gold gold digger and that she's only after Harry's money. She's only after the riches and the and the glamour and all that stuff. I think that Harry really wants to emphasize in this chapter that Meghan's not really like that at all. And it also points to this is like their third date together and Meghan stuck it out through this. Like if she was under the impression that like, oh, I'm gonna be dating a prince and therefore me and this prince are gonna go to like a five-star hotel and he's gonna wine and dine me and we're gonna eat lobster tails all day like she's had a reality check here that that's not who he is either and that's not what she's gonna be getting out of him is this like super luxe experience so I think he's just also trying to make clear like putting all of that bullshit to rest she's not like some gold digger like she knows what she's getting into here like they're not gonna be like constantly traveling in the most luxe lifestyle and the most glamorous apartments and stuff. But while they're sitting in this little tent, she hears rustlings outside and she kind of like snuggles up to him. And it's like, oh, are, the, are we gonna be okay? And he tells her the last line of the chapter is, trust me, I'll keep you safe. I think this is a big theme of this chapter where Harry is constantly telling Megan, you, you should trust me, you should believe in me. I'm gonna do everything in my power to keep you safe. Right, And we're gonna kind of get into, as the book unfolds, how Harry has fulfilled that promise, how he's how, how he's actually kept that end of the bargain, and, and in some ways, how he feels like he, in some ways, didn't keep her safe, and that he wasn't prepared, he wasn't sure how to keep her safe, and that he asked her to put a lot of trust in him, but maybe he wasn't really deserving of that trust, or he didn't know. There were so many unknown unknowns that he didn't really understand about what it would mean for her to be a part of his life. And so I really like this line, how much he wants her to trust him and he wants to keep her safe, but how much he might have failed on that part and where he's also really tried to succeed because he feels like he has made a promise to her that he is going to do this. He's made a commitment to her and how that shapes the choices that he's had to make. Chapter seven, they just continue to have this amazing trip in Botswana. They're they're out in the natural environment, 
watching the animals, being with Teej and Mike. There's a little glint in the middle of the chapter, which I really liked, where they're all out for a swim in the water, and it reminds him of this old saying from the beginning of the book about how the bath water in Balmoral is extra sweet. And then he thinks, oh, I better not think of Balmoral. The anniversary was only one week away, the anniversary of his mother's death. I love that little moment we get here of things that kind of like trigger some memory to something about his mom or about sort of his royal life and his royal duties and all of that and how he's like oh well let's 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 put that aside right now let's be happy in this moment but also the, again that there's that's li that's little thing in the back of his mind you gotta tell her you gotta start to put all the pieces together about what the royal family is. You know, what it's gonna mean if she's part of your life, right? And he's not quite willing to start to throw all of that out there and be like, this is everything you need to know about my family. This is everything, all the history, all the drama, all the tea, all the ceremony and the pomp and circumstance and my own traumas, right? Because he's also talking about, you know, the anniversary's mother's death. Like in their first couple months of dating someone, who's gonna be sitting there and vomiting up all of their childhood traumas and all of their like family toxicity. It's understandable why you didn't want to put that all out on her immediately, but it's also, it's a sticky situation because of this like ticking time bomb of the press. At some point they're gonna know, at some point she's gonna be thrust into this world of the media that he's not really prepared her for. He also mentions again, just all the things that she's done and all the things that he admires about her. She's been a fierce activist for women's rights, for women's issues. The way that she's built up her businesses, the way that she started this website, the TIG. Everything that he's also learning about her on this trip and, and he's getting to know more about her in the back of his mind. He's like, I heard this faint drum beat. You know, she's perfect, she's perfect, she's perfect. It totally makes sense. He's thinking she's everything. She, not only do we have all these common interests and our life plans, our life goals are so similar, but also in some ways she's perfect for this role as well, right? Harry, as a member of the royal family, when he's thinking about his life partner, it's also in some way he has to kind of like cast someone in that role because the royal family is basically a bunch of mascots, right? And so he has to cast someone in that role that's gonna be someone that the, the public and the media is going to like. And he's thinking, well, this would be perfect. She's fulfilling this role of she's doing good work. She's a big philanthropist. She's an entrepreneur. She's a feminist. She could be a feminist icon, you know, she could, you know, represent somebody that's, you know, n not a gold digger. Like, and in fact, like probably thinking the opposite, right? She's got all these successful businesses. She's a woman in her own right. She doesn't need me. Like she's already got all these other accomplishments and she can really bring that to the table. And so I think it's also reiterating this idea that Harry doesn't even really see what the problem would be when the media does need her. I think he's starting to understand, oh, actually, when it does get to that point and the press does like know about us, that maybe it's not gonna be that so bad, right? Because she she has all these amazing accomplishments. Like what could they possibly say about her? Like what what's gonna be the big problem? And this gets to the racism, right? Like. Harry is so sheltered that he's not even thinking about the racism angle because he's not thinking about race. He's in his own little world. He's never had to think about, oh, they might go in the direction of just being racist. They're not gonna look at all of her accomplishments and all her great charity work and stuff. It's gonna be about race. And that's something that both Harry, we see in this moment is not thinking about. He's thinking she's perfect, she's perfect. This is everything that they want in the, somebody in part of the royal family business. He's totally sheltered in other ways, totally unprepared and not thinking about that. And we've also heard that in some ways, Meghan wasn't thinking about that, but I've got a whole video again about Meghan Markle and mixed race identity and why it's something that's difficult to confront and blah, blah, blah. Go watch that video. If I'm pointing in the wrong direction, I'm just gonna flip, flip the video. 
There we go. I also like at the end of this chapter, he also mentions that his previous girlfriends used to talk about how he had a Jekyll and Hyde existence. And we kind of get glimpses of that in the book, right? He says that they would complain in Botswana, Harry would be this happy, go lucky. His nickname right in Botswana is Spike. They would get nice, happy Spike. You know, life is great. They're on the, you know, they're out in the savanna looking at animals. And then they would get the sort of dour, sad, depressed Prince Harry when they go back to London and they have to live the sort of royal family life. And how there was just these two parts of him, right, that didn't seem to like mesh. He was two different people to them and that made it hard to be with him. And Harry mentions that he thinks with, when he's getting to know Meghan more, he thinks, oh, I could be this happy person all the time. Wouldn't it be great if I could, if I could meld this happy person that I am in Botswana, if I could bring it back to London? I think he's again, really thinking about the future if we're together for the long haul. She has all of these things things that could make the sort of royal family life worth living, right? That she's also really invested in doing all these charity works and doing this and that with me and we could do it together and we could be happy doing it together. And so he must have been really excited about that thought that, oh my God, I, I can have it all, right? I can be a part of this family. I can do all the good work. I have this amazing woman who can do it with me. We both are super compatible. This is amazing. <laughs> oh, if only, if only it were that simple. <laughs> Chapter eight, Harry goes on to meet some of his other friends, hanging out, jet skiing and all that stuff. While he's with his friends, his phone drops in the middle of the water, schoolboy error. Harry is like super distraught. He's like, how am I gonna contact Megan? Oh my God, what if every picture I have is destroyed? Listen, I'm there as well. I'm a digital hoarder too. So the thought of me losing my phone and losing all of the data on my phone, Oh, that gives me anxiety. So I get it. The big takeaway here is he's really worried. He's not going to have any contact with Megan and she's just not going to know what happened to him. He's worried she's going to think that he ghosted her or something. I also like he's looking for like a pen or something like he's like, oh, like I could write her a letter or something like he just wants to be able to contact her in some way. So he says, no, a pen. A biro, my kingdom for a biro. It's a Shakespearean reference. It's very interesting. There's a lot of Shakespearean, we haven't talked about this a lot, but there's a lot of Shakespearean references in the book. We talked a little bit about how he starred in a Shakespeare play in Eton. There's a bunch of stuff about how his father wanted him to study Shakespeare. This is a line that is a reference to Richard III. It's very interesting how the book has this ongoing narrative and this ongoing theme of Shakespeare and in some ways Shakespearean tragedy and how a lot of Shakespeare's about histories about the royal family and they are still a part of it. They're still part of this whole cosmic Shakespearean tragedy drama. Their real life in some ways is still kind of connected to this Shakespearean legacy. It's very interesting. He mentions earlier on in the book a reference to Hamlet where his father said that he should read Hamlet and he's like, no, it's about a broody man whose parent killed their other parent so that they could marry their adulterer. No. <laughs> anyway, chapter nine, finally Harry is like, I'm gonna write Megan a letter. And I liked that he said, the next best thing I figured in the absence of lyricism would be to make the letter physically beautiful. So he's going around the countryside, like picking flowers and stuff to like beautify this letter. Harry is always thinking, I'm not a good writer. Or I'm not well read. I'm not well educated. That he doesn't have a way with words or anything like that, which I, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if that's just his own lack of confidence, but I like that he was kind of thinking about it that way, where he was like, I, I want it to be special in some way. And so he's just like collecting all of these flowers and stuff to put on it. Oh, it's cringe. I love it. Again, this chapter, we talk about what are the rules that Harry thinks are part of like royal dating. Roy, sorry, I didn't mean to flip you off. No, <laughs> royal dating. What are, what are some of like the, the 
customs and procedures of being dating and getting engaged and getting married in the royal family. He mentions, I'd always told myself that there were firm rules about relationships, at least when it came to royalty. And the main one was that you absolutely must date a woman for three years before taking the plunge. How else could you know about her? How else could she know about you and your royal life? How else could both of you be sure that this was what you wanted, that it was a thing you could endure together? It wasn't for everybody. But Meghan seemed the shining exception to the rule. All rules. I knew her straight away, and she knew me. The true me. Might seem rash, I thought. Might seem illogical, but it's true. For the first time, in fact, I felt myself to be living in truth. Again, I, I like that gives us a little bit more clarity. He talks about, again, these conceptions about the rules and the regulations and the procedures of being royal. You must do this. You must be together for three years. You must figure this out. There can't be any deviation from these paths. And he thinks about, well, this doesn't ring true to me. I feel like we do have this connection. Like we know a lot of stuff about it. We have this connection. And I think he's really, he's thinking about the, the emotional connection side of it. I think he is kind of ignoring that part about how else could she know about the royal life. I do think that was something that she didn't really know about. And I think he kind of put that on the back burner because he was kind of leading with, oh, but we have this emotional connection and I feel like spiritually fulfilled. I do think he failed here in terms of like the, yeah, they maybe could have had a little bit more time because the royal life bit was a big part of it that he didn't really fully explain. And we'll see all the bits and pieces of it where he's very bad at explaining it. I mean, there's some things that I, I don't fault Harry for not saying, and there's a lot of things that I think he really did fuck up. Um, we see it again in chapter 10 here. They're texting, FaceTiming, they're constantly in contact with each other. They were really desperate to meet up together though. They've been gone for a long time. Finally, she comes back to London, but she comes, it's the last day in August. So again, it's around his mother, the anniversary of his mother's death. She says, I'm here, come see me. I can't, I'm in the car. Doing what? Something for my mom. Your mom, where? Althorpe. What's Althorpe? Where my uncle Charles lives. I told her I'd explain later. We still hadn't talked about all that. I felt pretty sure she hadn't Googled me because she was always asking questions. She seemed to know almost nothing. So refreshing. It showed that she wasn't impressed by royalty, which I thought the first step to surviving it. More, since she hadn't done a deep dive into the literature, the public record, her head wasn't filled with disinformation. This shows very much how he almost wants to protect her from all this information about the family. He's very guarded about telling her all that about the royal aspect because I think he, he almost thinks of her as like super pure and he finds it again, he finds it refreshing that she doesn't know all of the deep lore, right? She doesn't know all this lore about this drama and that drama. Like she didn't watch The Crown, okay? Like she just doesn't, she doesn't know all the deep, the deep juicy goss and he likes that but he's almost like protecting her from giving more information because he wants to keep her innocent of that after going from his mom's grave he goes immediately into hopping into megan's bed it doesn't say that explicitly but it pretty much does say that explicitly if you want to pop up the freud freud was right this is all freudian yeah okay yep i agree there's a lot more Megan and the mother connection. Yes, Megan and Diana. There is definitely a big connection being played here. So chapter 11, they are going to have a little bit of like a night in. So they're talking about going to wait Rose to go buy some groceries. And Harry, we've talked about Harry has his own little methods of going to the grocery store and disguises and stuff like that. He basically says that him and Megan could do this together where they both put on disguises and they just don't acknowledge each other but are kind of secretly shopping together and they do that really quick and go back home, make some salmon. 
What's interesting about this is that Harry, at the end of this chapter, talks about how he walks past going home and he says to himself, I can't wait for you all to meet her. He's starting to psych himself up for this idea of introducing Megan to the public, you know, as his life partner forever. This is it, this is the one. I think there's also this implication that he felt like she was able to perform the role because this seemed like a little bit of a test. Oh, she can do the whole walking around in disguises, shopping. She's able to do that. So she seems like she's able to perform this role. She's able to do, you know, the same things that I do to kind of evade the paparazzi and get away with it. And so I think he sees that as like, oh, good. That's another thing that she kind of checks off the boxes, that she's able to kind of live this sort of like sneaky undercover life. But again, there's a whole bunch of other parts to being in the royal family that he hasn't really talked about with her. But he kind of sees this as oh, this is another step in the right direction to knowing that she's a good candidate. She's a good choice for this. Again, casting the role as his wife, Duke and Duchess of Sussex, that title she would fulfill. Chapter 12, he talks about they are going to Not Caught, which is where Harry is living right now. And he says that he was excited, but also embarrassed. He said, Not Caught was no palace. Not caught was palace adjacent. That was the best you could say for it. I know a lot of people want to like say, well, Harry is so spoiled and entitled and blah, blah, for making comments like this. But seriously though, my house now is bigger than not caught, okay? In terms of square footage, most people's houses are bigger than not caught, I'm pretty sure. So I totally get it. I totally get it. As far as people are concerned, we were living at a palace, and we were, in a cottage we on, were a living pa on, on palace, palace grounds. grounds. Yeah. Kensington Palace sounds very regal. Of course it does. It says palace in the name. But Nottingham Cottage was so small. The whole thing's on a slight, on a slight lean, <laughs> really low ceiling, so I don't know who was there before. They must have been very short. He would just hit his head constantly in that, <laughs> that place because he's so tall. Me with a hoe and H varnishing. It was just a chapter in our lives where I don't think anyone could believe what it was actually like behind the scenes. Well, Oprah came over for tea, didn't she? She did. And when she came in, she sat down, she goes, no one would ever believe it. No one would ever believe it. <laughs> and I know there's people like, oh, people live in shacks, people work. Yes, I understand people live in worse situations, okay? That doesn't invalidate your experiences if you feel like your place is pretty small and not equivalent to a fucking palace. The reality of what royal family life is like, it's all like twisting and turning on its head, right? Harry is a prince and he's living in a fucking shack on his brother's property. He's like a fucking squatter. <laughs> they don't provide him anything nicer than that. Which again, if I were Megan, I would walk into this and be like, how is that possible that your family owns all of this property and all, all of this stuff and they offer you this shack? I would be so confused by that. How is that, how is it possible you're like, you were previously, like he's what, fifth in line to the throne at this point? It just shows also the sort of weirdness of the whole hierarchy of the family. His brother is living in a palace and he's literally living in like a one bedroom apartment. He's also embarrassed because it's all, it's very bachelor patty. It's got like the Xbox, probably got a lot of like beer cans kicking around. She says it's kind of frat house, it's kind of fratty. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect anything less. They have dinner with Princess Eugenie and her boyfriend, Jack, very cute. Unfortunately, Megan falls ill, like actually like sick, vomiting, gross, horrible food poisoning. This is also showing that they're, they're in this for, you know, the personal support of each other, holding your hair back in your worst moments, vomiting on the floor kind of part, like of their relationship, which is a milestone. They don't tell you about that when you go to relationship counseling, but yeah. That's, that's a sign. Right before Megan is about to leave again for Canada on this trip, they finally think they're, as they're walking around Frogmore Cottage, which again is a 
nice sign. This will become their residence at a long time from now in the book. Interesting foreshadowing. But as they're wandering around, they talk about how they need to sort of discuss this relationship. Where's this going? How are they gonna sustain this? They need a game plan. Now, they live in two separate countries. They don't really wanna do long distance all the time. How are they gonna give this an actual go? So they try to come to an agreement where they have to see each other at least every two weeks to make this sort of sustainable. She had a two week rule, which is very smart, that said we had to see each other in or around two weeks. I said, how is that even possible with the stuff that I'm doing? I'm not going to be able to travel to see you that much. It was much easier for me to go and see him in the UK. I could still just get on a commercial flight and go and see him under the radar. In those first few months when no one knew, it made much more sense for her to come to me so that then she can come and stay with me on Kensington Palace grounds. We can then jump in the car, we can head up to Windsor and go for walks around Frogmore um, and do all these things together so that we can like get to know each other without someone taking a photograph and then it becoming like news. But Harry is like, my movements attract more attention. He says, governments had to be alerted when I crossed international borders. Local police had to be notified. All my bodyguards had to be shuffled. And so he says, therefore, Megan kind of had to shoulder that burden of doing more of the traveling and more of the sustaining of the relationship in that way. Teddy? What is it? Right here? You're a little too big for this, buddy. <laughs> You're not a little kitten anymore. So he says he like feels really guilty about it, but that Megan really had to shoulder that responsibility of them seeing each other that frequently because she just had more freedom to really travel. Now that should have been a big red sign for her, a big red flag about the whole, how difficult it is when you become part of the royal family to travel, to live your life, to do all things that she loves to do. But they, I don't think they're fully coming together to discuss what that's really gonna look like. New day, new cat, okay? I know. All right, now we get to my favorite scene in the book so far. This is chapter 14. This actually leaked before the book came out and I was so excited because I was like, this sounds so realistic and so crazy, but it just shows how these people have real human emotions. And I don't know, something about this scene is so human and so realistic that I'm like, this definitely happened. This definitely happened. Harry goes over to Wills and Kate's house and they're just hanging out, having dinner. And of course, Harry, because of all of the stuff that's happened so far, he is just really excited about Megan and introducing Megan to the family. He's just had over heels in love. So like he cannot contain his sort of excitement to sort of like spill the news, uh, tell them about what's going on. He kind of mentions that Will and Kate seemed like they kind of knew that something was up and they were really trying to like gather information from Harry. Like, who is this person? Like, what's going on? I, I just have to read this whole thing because the, it's so funny, okay? I casually mentioned that there was a new woman in my life. They surged forward. Who is she? I'll tell you, but please, 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 I need you both to keep it a secret. Yes, Harold, yes. Who is it? She's an actress. Oh? She's American. Oh. On a show called Suits. Their mouths fell open. They turned to each other. Then Willie turned to me and said, fuck off. What? No way. Sorry? Impossible. I was baffled until Willie and Kate explained that they were regular, nay, religious viewers of Suits. The fuck off from Will is, is the best moment of the text. I really hope that he actually said that because it is hilarious. It just breaks the illusion to me that these people are just like divine beings, right? They're literally just sitting there like, fucking shut up. Me? A, a princess? Shut up. 
beg your pardon, shut up. I think it's so human. And it also shows here that when he first introduces this idea of Megan to Wills and Kate, they seem excited. They seem like super interested in meeting her because they love this show so much. And so I think that lures Harry into thinking everything's going really well. I thought that they were gonna be really nervous about this or really upset about this, but you know, they're really actually interested in her and they like this show. So like maybe everything's gonna be okay. At the end of the chapter though, there is a little bit of a sign of some things to come. Harry is happy that Wills and Kate seem to be accepting of Megan and really interested and excited to meet her, which is what Harry is excited for as well. But there is a little bit of a sinister end to the chapter. As we've mentioned before, Harry has always been excited about this idea of getting married and becoming a real person in the royal family. He said before, if you're not married in the royal family, you seem to act as a sort of non-entity. And so the only way that you can sort of get power within the business is to be married. And he kind of mentions this at the end here that he had been looking forward for a long time to becoming a foursome with Wills and Kate and him and whoever his partner wife was going to be. And he mentions at the end of this chapter that he said this to William a lot, right? That he was excited for this idea that they were gonna be this magical foursome. He says, I'd said this to Willie so many times and he'd always replied, it might not happen, Harold and you've got to be okay with that. And he even reiterates that sort of at the end of the chapter. He says, she's an American actress after all, Harold. Anything might happen. I remember my family first meeting her and being incredibly impressed. Some of them didn't quite know what to do with themselves. Because <laughs> um, I think they were, they were surprised. Maybe surprised that a ginger could land such a beautiful woman and such an intelligent woman. But the fact that I was dating an American actress was probably what clouded their judgment more than anything else at the beginning. Oh, she's an American actress. This won't last. The actress thing was the biggest problem, funny enough. There is a big idea of what that looks like from the UK standpoint. Hollywood and... It's just very easy for them to typecast that. It does feel like there's a little bit of a sinister turn here. I actually wonder if there was kind of a secret hope that Harry would never marry. Thinking about some of the other things that happen in the book where, you know, there's all these concerns, well, maybe we're not gonna give you money or we're not gonna have enough security for you. We're not gonna be able to give your children titles and stuff. All of those things that seem to be taking some of that power away from Harry and his wife, it almost seems like maybe there was this secret hope that he wasn't going to get married. The the royal family is very nervous about inviting new people into the business. Every time that somebody gets married or somebody new is welcomed in or even having a new child, that's another person that you have to share a piece of the pie. And not only for like greedy purposes, but I think also for power and the power dynamics and the hierarchies in the family, the more people become involved in that business, the more the power structures within the business start to dissolve somewhat, the more that that power seems to be spread out amongst more people, the more the people within that system might feel like they're losing power. And so I think there was genuinely kind of this secret concern, right, about if Harry invited somebody new into that circle. Although William is kind of phrasing it as, you know, like you just have to like take what comes, maybe it's not gonna happen, you know? As much as it sounds like maybe he's saying that out of a concern for Harry or just trying to prepare him for maybe heartbreak or, or difficulties in his romantic life, it can also be read as kind of a sinister way of William pushing Harry away from the idea of getting married Again, I can't be in William's head, but maybe that's a concern about the amount of power and influence that Harry and his new wife could have. Or it could also be just a genuine fear and concern about press, 
We've talked about a lot how the family sees that they are constantly put in competition with each other based on the press. The press loves to run with stories in which people are pitted against each other within the royal family. Things that we've seen in the past, like the court circular, for example, which was discussed in part two, where family members are compared for how much work that they do, is already something that we see that they're genuinely concerned about the appearances and how the press reports on their sort of usefulness. And the monarchy, of course, has to appear somewhat useful. Otherwise, people would say, why are we paying for these people? And William and Harry have seen that sort of rivalry, not just in their personal life, but put in the media itself. William and Harry against each other. William as the sort of academic smart one and Harry as the sort of dumb party boy one. We've seen that with comparisons between, say, Diana and Camilla, even recently with pitting different women in the royal family against each other. And that can also show that sort of rivalry. And we see that happen when Meghan does become a part of the family, pitting Meghan and Kate against each other and trying to compare these women and how much they're doing and how good of a mother they are and how warm they are and friendly they are. So it's hard to say, is this coming from a place of genuine maliciousness maybe? And that sort of greed for power or, or not wanting to share power with somebody new coming into the family? Or is there a genuine concern about the press when there's more people involved in the family, the press has more ways to pit them against each other? It's unclear. This is also not even getting into the fact that later on, Harry and we, the people, recognize now that the accusation now is that the royal family is not only sort of concerned about this press, sort of like in the ether, but that the press is right there on their doorstep and their press offices are competing against each other, which is highlighted really well in the Harry and Meghan documentary. For every Duke and Duchess, there is also a communication team. Comms for the royal family is very similar to a press office, press spokesperson for politicians and businesses, celebrities. There is a communications team at Buckingham Palace, at Clarence House, at Kensington Palace, all of whom had a primary duty to their own principles. These communications teams allow the family to be one step removed from dealing with the media. Overall, there is a, a, an aspiration for a controlled narrative. These separate press offices for different royal family members can actually be con working against each other and by planting and leaking negative stories about other royal family members in order to boost the appearance of their specific family members that they protect. Is that a genuine concern about those press offices or is it malicious in that they don't want to have to deal with that possibility of another press office that's leaking and planting stories and potentially discrediting them? Was it sort of like a disappointment to the family when Harry actually did get married? And did that actually spark a lot of concern or jealousy or maybe just fear? Unclear, but we're gonna see how that kind of manifests throughout the book. So in chapter 15, Harry and Meghan are hanging out again. She's come to visit and they decide that they're gonna go meet Fergie, but on their way to Fergie's house, Sarah Ferguson's house, they learn that the queen has stopped by for a visit. And so this means that this is gonna be Meghan's first time meeting the queen. So neither of them was fully prepared for this moment, but we also get to see here that there, there's a big culture clash and a big sort of misunderstanding about the royal family 
that again is going to permeate throughout this and again it just shows Gary just not fully understanding that this stuff is not normal and it might not be what somebody expects going into the royal family. While they're on the way there Harry asks Meghan if she knows how to curtsy because she's about to meet the queen she needs to be able to curtsy to her. They have an exchange here. Harry says you're about to meet the queen. I know but it's your grandma but she's the queen. So Megan doesn't fully understand that this is like serious business because I think there's a misunderstanding about how the royal family actually functions behind closed doors. I think a lot of people unacquainted with the royal family or Americans that don't know much about the royal family might expect that the royal family in public because they serve as sort of mascots for the country, that in public there's a lot of protocols and procedures and where people stand and what people wear and how people act and curtsies and all that stuff. But you might believe that all of that's for public view in all these public ceremonies, public events, that all of that protocol is just for the performance aspect of the monarchy. And you might expect, well, but these people are still normal, regular people. So maybe behind closed doors, it's a little less formal, a little bit more relaxed. A lot of that protocol maybe goes out the wayside and people are just interacting normally when they're behind closed doors. The thing is, that's not the case. Royal family members are engaged in that royal protocol, supposedly, 24-7. You would expect maybe there would be some informality behind closed doors, but that's not the case. I guess I'd started to understand very quickly that the formality on the outside carried through on the inside, that there is a forward-facing way of being and then you close the door and you go, oh, great. Okay, we can relax now. But that formality carries over on both sides. And that was surprising to me. There's no off for the royal family. There's no point where everyone just relaxes and you go, oh, you know, that's the queen, but she's just your grand grandma. She's just your grandma and we just hang out like a grandma. No, if you're Megan and you don't know much about that going into it, I think that can be a really big mind shift for somebody that's not aware of that. You think at some point you're gonna get a relaxed, normal family environment, but they never shut it off. They're constantly living in the pomp and circumstance. And so I think that's something that Harry didn't really prepare Meghan for. Everybody's still very much in their roles, performing, as the queen, as a prince, they're, they're still performing that function constantly and all the protocol that goes around that. So as Megan is like walking into the situation for the first time, she's getting a full rundown. This is how you curtsy, ma'am, rhymes with ham. I remember that from the king's speech. You, you. It's your majesty the first time. After that, it's ma'am, as in ham, not mom, as in palm do this, do that. Like it's a lot of information that she has to get right before she walks into the situation. So Meg goes up to the queen, does a nice curtsy, and then engages the queen in a little bit of chit chat. What I found interesting is that the queen asked Meghan Markle what she thought of Donald Trump. This is circa 2016. I'm guessing she didn't have a lot of great things to say, but it says that Paul Meghan decided like politics was not a great way to go with the conversation. So she just changed the subject. And she mentions that she lived in Canada for most of the time, because that's where she was filming, was I believe in Toronto for suits. He makes a note that the queen kind of smiled, like, okay, it's a Commonwealth country, like, good. Everything kind of like wraps up really quickly, the queen leaves, and then as soon as the queen is gone, everybody sorts to sort of relax and the vibe changed, he said. And they go back to like their normal, regular, regular life. In Megan comments at the end, she asks like, who was that assistant with the queen? And it turns out the assistant she's talking about is Prince Andrew. And the last line of the chapter 
Harry is like, she definitely hadn't Googled us. This is the only sort of glimpse really that we get. I, there might be one more line about this, but this is the only glimpse that we get into Harry making any sort of comment about Prince Andrew and all of his horribleness. Um, Megan is completely new to all of this. Like she's not going into this with some understanding of even just who everybody is in the family, let alone every single bit of the protocol and how you stand and how you curtsy and how you do that. She knows none of that. Like she's lacking some of the basics. I think that this gap is really gonna widen. Harry, but and by extension, the entire family was not really helping to sit down and really kind of lay out, okay, this is what everything is. She's just getting bits and pieces of this. I think there needs to be better onboarding is what I'm saying, I think. This is not a good orientation. Chapter 16, this is where Megan meets William and Kate. Harry mentions that he was more nervous for this meeting than he even was for Megan meeting the queen, which I think is really says a lot about Harry and William's relationship and also maybe William's personality that Harry sees him as maybe harder to please. So they go up, Harry introduces Megan. She goes in to give William a hug and William completely freaked out and recoiled from this. It's something that they are not used to, that physical affection, even within their own family. So for Megan, who is a very affectionate, normal person, I would say, like as someone that is definitely a little bit more touchy feely and more into, you know, the typical gestures of human kindness. This I think set a lot of things off on the wrong foot. And Harry also says that it might also speak to this again, feeling of protocol and the maintaining the hierarchy of the family and the relationships. Harry writes, maybe Willie expected Meg to curtsy. He was thinking that she should show more deference to him as the heir or as somebody higher up in the family hierarchy. But in Megan's mind, she's going to meet the brother of her partner. So she has completely different expectations as to what she wants to do. She wants to introduce herself on a human level. I think she's still under the impression there's a point where you walk into the private lives of the royal family members and the protocol melts away and you know, oh, we just relax and kick off and interact as normal human beings. But it's the royal family members, especially the ones that seem very focused on this hierarchy, they don't act like that. They are really looking for that protocol 24 seven. They're being used to being treated with deference workers around the royal estates and visitors. They're not used to somebody just treats them like an equal right off the bat. And Harry takes a little bit of the blame here because he says, when meeting my grandmother, I'd made it clear this is the queen. But when meeting my brother, it was just Willie who loved suits. And so Harry kind of set it up like when the, when it was the queen, he was very focused on, okay, yes, this is my grandmother, but this is the queen and this is how we have to act in front of the queen. And he didn't really set that up with his brother. Again, he just thought, okay, this is my brother you're gonna go meet. And he didn't really bring up to her attention Oh, you're meeting like the heir. You're meeting someone that's higher up in rank than me. Because that's a pretty weird thing to think about as a family member, you know, like most people are not like thinking about their family members in terms of their rank. So again, I think it's really interesting. There's this huge sort of culture clash in the expectations. Is Megan joining a family or is Megan joining a business? And the truth is she's entering both, but I, I don't think that that's been super clarified. Kiri wants to feel like, oh, she's joining a family, but I think the family really sees it as, this is someone you're bringing into the business. And so that clash is gonna get bigger and bigger. And maybe Harry didn't fully understand that. Like we said before, Harry has 
only for a brief period of his life been a full-time royal. So I think he doesn't really fully understand what the full-time royal job is. Charles and William, it sounds like they've had a lot of time to really think about the family business and the strategies of the family business. And I think they kind of kept a lot of that information between themselves and didn't really bring Harry into the fold. It's very Godfather. It's very, it very much is like the Godfather. Not that Harry is the Frito of all of this, but it does feel very Godfather. So they chat a little bit. It turns out Kate's not home. The kids aren't home. So they're kind of like, oh, okay. Bye. <laughs> Chapter 17 now, we're getting into Megan meeting Charles and Camilla for the first time. They're heading up to Clarence House where they now reside. Harry makes a comment that after he moved out from Clarence House, Camilla turned his bedroom into her personal dressing room and that really stung for him. Camilla sounds like an asshole. <laughs> Of all the things that you could do. As they're getting ready for this, we notice as well Harry making a lot of comments about what his father likes and doesn't like in women. I really don't like this part. Like, Charles seems to have a lot of opinions about women and what they wear and what makeup they have and so on. None of his fucking business, but nobody has ever told Charles that in his life, I think, to shut the fuck up and nobody cares what he thinks. He mentions that he told Megan ahead of time, you know, my father really likes women that wear their hair down. My father really likes women that wear a little bit less makeup. And he's kind of giving her a sense of what his father likes. I personally, if I were Megan, I would feel a little bit uncomfortable with that. Cause I would be like, I wear whatever the fuck I want. But I mean, again, it's the Royal family. So I guess that kind of pushback is not, not expected. As he's giving her the little bit of the low down on how she needs to behave. Like moments before they walk into a room, Harry is like, you need to do this, curtsy here, do this. Which again is not good teaching. I feel like this, he should probably be teaching her all of this at a neutral time. But I think Harry just dislikes all of this stuff so much that he puts off teaching it to Megan until the last possible second, which is not really a great strategy if Megan is gonna have to live this life forever. But as they're going in, he talks about, you know, for Pa, you have to curtsy and refer to him as your Royal Highness. And then he says, for Camilla, no curtsy. And she says, no curtsy, you sure? And he says, I didn't think it appropriate. Oh snap, oh snap. Very much a big disdain for Camilla. He very much is like, do not give her any of the sort of attention of a Royal family member. And I think that also ties in a lot to we talked about how Charles seems to not be satisfied with just having Camilla as a partner, but also trying to legitimize her within the hierarchy. And as now the queen consort of the United Kingdom, I mean, that alone, getting to a point where Camilla could even take on that title without riots in the streets, that took a lot of PR. And we can see here that no matter what the PR is that has kind of helped Camilla rise up from mistress to queen consort of the United Kingdom, it might not necessarily have worked within the family. I think she was still definitely seen as other than by Charles. But from this comment, I can see maybe William and Harry do not fully accept Camilla as like a valuable member of the family because of the way that she's treated them personally. They don't necessarily see her as warranting that same amount of respect as if she were a sort of real queen consort or a, or a real princess of Wales or Duchess or whatever her title was. I don't remember what her title was at the time. Duchess of Cornwall, whatever. So they kind of just outlined the meeting that they had. It sounds like Megan and Charles really got off on a good start. They had really good conversations. They talked about British and American things. He asked her about her show, talking about animals and Megan's love of dogs and how she bonds with Charles and Camilla about this because they're very much into animal rights activism and charity work. And overall, they made it sound like this was very successful. They got on very well. They had a lot of things in common, a lot of things to talk about. 
And Harry kind of notes that they fell into sort of the standard procedure of a more formal dinner occasion. He talks a little bit about how like in a typical like dinner situation, you would talk to one conversation partner on one side of you, and then you kind of switch to the other conversation partner. You kind of keep a conversation going in that way. And that they seemed to kind of just do that naturally here at this meeting. I think this also shows maybe a hint of Harry thinking, oh, Megan can do this job successfully. Like she's already falling into doing this naturally, having these conversations very similar to a state dinner or a formal event, being able to guide the conversation, find things to connect with. And so I think this is a sign for Harry of like, oh yeah, she, for this role, of being a duchess or being my wife in these formal situations, she can really hold her own. And so I think it's interesting looking at this from Harry's perspective where he feels like the more he's introducing Megan to this, the more she seems ready for the kind of situations and things that are gonna be a big part of their life. And he's kind of making these mental notes oh, she's, she is really successful at this. She is gonna do a good job of this. But on the flip side, he's also not giving her the full picture, I feel like, of what it means to live in this family structure. She's getting glimpses and pieces of it, but this is also in the introductory phase to his relationships, right? So she might think, okay, we're having this like formal dinner to meet your father and his wife. Right, and this is why it's maybe a little bit more formal, a little bit less natural, but maybe thinks, okay, but at some point we'll get to a point where we're gonna have like a natural, relaxed atmosphere. That's never gonna come. So chapter 18, here he goes to go visit Megan and she shows him her house, her dogs, her friends. They go to a Halloween party. As they're kind of getting ready to go to this party, they get news that the story is on the cusp of breaking about their relationship and that it's about to go public. And then he and his brother's communication secretary, Jason, called him to let him know that the story was scooped by a tabloid. He said, well, if it's gonna come out tomorrow, then let's go and have fun tonight. We went to this Halloween party together where we could be completely dressed up and no one would know. Bandana and you goggles. You borrowed a great costume. You borrowed a great costume. And we were like, well, this might be our last shot to just go out and have fun. Pull the pin the on the world. fun grenade, of which we did. His cousin Eugenie and her boyfriend at the time, Jack, my friend Marcus, were there too. It was so great. It was silly fun. And then... At this point, it seems because of Harry's sort of perspective on this and the slow easing into their relationship and getting her comfortable with that, and also because he's just so excited about Megan and just can't get enough of her. He's head over heels in love with her. He wants to talk about her all the time. He wants to get to know her more and wants other people to get her know her more. I think that he's like, almost excited for the news to break that they're together, which is a big contrast to how he knows that the press actually operates, but I think he's in a little bit of a fantasy world right now. Everything's gone well so far that I think he's almost like excited. Okay, we're gonna finally get to the point where the news is gonna break and we can just be out in the open together. And he mentions and asks her like, are you ready for what's gonna come? And she's kind of like, yeah, I think so. But Megan doesn't know what the paparazzi is like for the royal family members. We see this culture clash, the difference between how the celebrity world works outside of royal life and how the celebrity world works inside royal life. It's a big difference. I think, again, Megan might be thinking, okay, there's gonna be some reporting on this, some interest in this story. I'm gonna see it kind of blow up, 
but I don't think she was really expecting it to go to this level because she doesn't know anything about the connection between the royal family and the press or the history that's there. It's all brand new to her. So she says that she's ready, but how could she really know that she was gonna be ready for that? And Harry kind of like somewhat warns her. He mentions, we're gonna be hunted, no two ways about it. But Megan is really relying on Harry to help her to understand what she's getting into. And I think Harry did a really bad job of preparing her for this because again, he was in that sort of fantasy headspace. Oh, it's all gonna work out well. Maybe this time it works, who knows? Maybe my girlfriends won't be hunted down to the point of suicide. Let's see, maybe this is gonna be the time where the press has some sort of human connection and just celebrates their love, celebrates their story. No, you know where this is going, right? You know what happens next? Chapter 19. Here he starts to detail all of the press that's coming out and how Megan is being treated by the press. We see instantly racist headlines coming out from major news organizations or major tabloids that really harp on Megan's race. These have been outlined in many different ways, but Harry just reiterates them in the book as well. Things like headlines like Harry's girl is almost straight out of Compton. Gang scarred home of her mother revealed that she's gonna thicken their watery blue blood with some rich and exotic DNA. Mentioning that there are 47 crimes have happened in Compton where Megan is supposedly from even though she's not from Compton. Statements about Megan's mother saying that she's from the wrong side of the tracks, that she wears dreadlocks. The UK is perfect at doing this, right? Nobody wants to be openly racist, or that wouldn't be civilized and that wouldn't be British, uh, but it's perfectly fine to kind of dog whistle, give a nod to. She's a diva, she's, she's making people cry, this kind of angry black woman trope. It just really came, came to the fore uh, really quite suddenly. Like even the stereotyping and the association to drugs or terrorism. There's a time they put my picture and Megan's picture saying that the mosque that is related to ISIS. Why? Pieces about whether Harry can legally marry a divorcee, which he's like, this is ridiculous. My father is a divorcee married to another divorcee. Princess Anne is a divorcee. I can't believe they even wrote a piece like that. Like, can Harry marry a divorcee? It's like, that ship has already sailed, my friends. Like. In the history of the royal family, there has been a lot of divorce and a lot of divorcees getting married, so. Just on and on and on and on media abuse, now that the story has broken. Here he goes to the palace lawyers and says, you've got to put out something here. You've got to put out a statement. This is getting way out of hand. So many of these things are just defamatory, right? So he's trying to get whatever sort of legal support he can to go after these papers. So they're constantly trying to send out these tepid warnings to the press. Hey, don't say that. Hey, this is false. It sounds like they have no bite, right? The lawyers go to the press. They say, hey, you should stop that. And the press goes, fuck you. I'm gonna do what I want. Because that's the point where the press has gotten. They're like, we're untouchable. Who cares what you have to say about it? They've already had all sorts of legal battles with the press not from them specifically, but the press themselves have gotten into all these legal battles about defamation or the phone hacking scandal and all that stuff. And they've walked away from all of those things pretty much scot-free. So why are they gonna listen to Harry's palace lawyer when they know that the royal family pretty much never pursues legal action because of the fear of how the press will retaliate against them? So there's just no way that they were gonna really listen to the palace legal team to stop this kind of rhetoric. So Harry keeps going back to the legal team. He's saying, we have to sue them. We have to pursue legal action here. They're not gonna stop. They're giving us a big, you know, middle finger. And the lawyer tells them basically, 
Well, suing them is what the papers really want. If you sue them, then you're gonna confirm that this relationship is legitimate and that's exactly what they want. You're gonna play into their hands. And we see here again, is this legal advice serving the interests of Harry and Meghan? Or is this legal team serving the interests of keeping the royal family sort of quiet? Or are they serving the interests of the press themselves? Because the press and the royal family are deeply, deeply intertwined. I don't know if the, there's really an answer to this, but it sounds like from a legal perspective, telling Harry that suing the papers is exactly what they want isn't totally accurate because we do see that suing these papers does get them into a lot of legal trouble because they have no leg to stand on. What they're doing is defamatory and illegal. So really they don't want people suing them because especially in the United Kingdom where libel laws and, and defamation laws are a lot more broad and people can get in a lot more trouble for the things that they insinuate in print media. It, do, it doesn't feel like this is proper legal advice. They definitely have a legal case. They definitely could pursue it. The thing is that they just don't want to potentially because of a fear about how the press is going to react to that, but I think partially it's also because the royal family doesn't actually care to support its members. And that's the tea. It says that his father, now King Charles, intervened. With hindsight, I now understand why staff at Clarence House, representing Charles and Camilla, were being so unhelpful and were seemingly blocking our every move. They had had, as they had a specific long-term strategy to keep the media, including NGN, on side in order to smooth the way for my stepmother and father to be accepted by the British public as Queen Consort and King respectively when the time came, and anything that might upset the apple cart in this regard, including the suggestion of resolution of our phone hacking claims, was to be avoided at all costs. You know, the, the feeling that he didn't necessarily realise that the enemies and the, the calls coming from inside the house basically. So everybody that Harry's turning to within the institution is basically saying, do nothing, don't pursue this, don't say anything, keep quiet, never complain, never explain, basically. He would try to pursue anything. The palace would say no, courtiers would say no. They'd be blocked at a lot of opportunities. But at a certain point, Harry realizes that he is not going to be looked favorably for allowing his girlfriend to be racially harassed by the press. He says he read an essay in the Huffington Post in which they said basically, the explosion of racism in the UK is to be expected because British people are racist as fuck because of colonialism. But what's unforgivable is Prince Harry standing by and allowing his girlfriend to suffer racist abuse from the press. That really wakes him up and he's like, no, I'm becoming complicit now in this racist abuse of Megan. That makes me look bad as a partner, right? That makes me look bad, not only that I don't wanna confront maybe my implicit racism and the history of colonialism, but I'm not willing to actually help and support my partner, that is pretty unforgivable. But we also hear from the documentary and some of the things that Harry has said in interviews and stuff like that, that the royal family didn't fully understand the concept of how different this is to be subjected to racist abuse and harassment versus just a regular press harassment. A lot of the royal family members saw press harassment as part of the game. It's part of all what you have to go through. If you're gonna enter this family, you're gonna get abused in some way. Now, a lot of that abuse is definitely a lot of isms. There's a lot of sexism and misogyny that goes into the way that these royal family members like Kate or Camilla have been abused by the press as they've entered into the family or have tried to grow their influence and power within the family. Harry has talked about his abuse from the press and how they've labeled him, tried to denigrate his character. That's happened to William. He kind of mentions a little bit of that in the book as well. It's definitely happened to Charles as well. He was definitely hated by the press, especially around 
everything happening with Diana, right? So they've all gone through abuse from the press, racist abuse from the press, if you're silent about that, you look like you're tacitly condoning racism. And when you're the royal family, and it looks like you're condoning racism, it's definitely gonna look bad on you. But the problem is that a lot of the people within the royal family are racists. They believe in race as a determining factor of people's qualities and traits. Now they might not openly say that, but there's definitely a lot about how they've grown up and what they've learned and the education that they've received that has implanted a lot of racist and colonial ideas in people in the royal family so that they do hold racist beliefs and ideas. So that's definitely one issue. They might not feel like they want to respond because they genuinely hold racist values. But I think that that's, that's looking at it from like the worst possible perspective. I think there's definitely people in the family that do have that and would say, we're not going to condemn racism because we hold racist values and beliefs. I think that could be part of it. I think another part of it is this belief that if you don't say anything about the abuse, that it will dissipate. But the thing with racist abuse, right? This isn't just abusing someone for making a mistake, right? Or uh, an action that they took. This isn't like, say, the abuse that Harry received for, say, wearing the Nazi uniform, right? That was really a condemnation of his actions but it was a condemnation that was unfair in a way. The way that they talked about condemning that, it was very much about just being rude to Harry and saying, well, you're an idiot and you're a racist and you're a Nazi and you're a horrible person, you're a party boy and blah. Where that abuse stemmed from was still based in actions that people were taking. Sometimes it wasn't. Again, sometimes it was deeply rooted in like misogyny. But in a lot of these cases, they were stemming from actual actions that these members took, and then the abuse would follow. In the case of racist abuse, what did Megan do? She was black. That's not really something that you should condemn people for, and you should definitely not abuse people over an inherent characteristic like their race. It's a very big difference. It's not something that you can really ignore, because if you ignore it, then you're basically saying the connections that you're making between the abusive things that you're saying or the insinuations that you're making and race are valid. They are allowed in the discourse, right? If you want to criticize Megan for being from the wrong side of the tracks and having a mother who wears dreadlocks or she grew up in Compton and there's 47 murders in Compton or whatever, by being silent on that, you're basically saying that all of those condemnations have some truth to them that we can make the implicit argument that race is some part of defining Megan's character. And if you go down that lot, you're just being racist. But the royal family can't see that. They're, they're so unused to the race conversation that they just think this is like any other sort of abuse that they would get from the press. But it's very much not. And Harry starts to open up his eyes to that and see, oh no, like this is, we have to condemn this because otherwise it makes it look like we're all a bunch of racists. And the royal family is like, well, you know, is it that bad if we're looked at as racists? I don't know, maybe it'll appeal to our base. Uh, and that that's also where it's like that, then it can be a little bit more nefarious. It's like, are they not condemning the racism because the demographic of people that supports the royal family are racists and they don't want to alienate that base? That, that becomes sort of like a, similar to the sort of Donald Trump angle, right? Where you could say, well, we don't know in our heart of hearts how racist Donald Trump is. Oh, look at my African-American over here. But he's definitely not willing to condemn people that are out and out racist. 
So maybe he's at least cynically appealing to a base of racists. And we could definitely see maybe the royal family doing the same thing. Uh, who supports the royal family the most is typically conservative people, people that believe in traditional values and very conservative in po their political leanings, but also in their personal life, and could also be holding on to some conservative traditional values that are basically code for racism. So is the royal family just unwilling to alienate that group of supporters of the royal family because those royal family supporters are racist? And if that's the case, that's again really terrifying that they're willing to court that base in order to maintain power. So in chapter 20, Harry is like, no, I have to make a statement. I'm, I'm putting out a statement. So they put out a statement saying, I do not support, well, I should say Harry puts out a statement saying, I do not support the racist, abusive language against Meghan, especially in the press and the media. Eight days after the relationship became public, I put out a statement calling out the racist undertones of articles and headlines that were written by the British press, as well as outright racism um, from those articles across uh, social media. Kensington yes, Palace issuing a statement about the harassment being experienced by Meghan Markle. Now he says that she has suffered abuse and harassment with racist undertones. Prince Harry is worried about Miss Markle's safety and is deeply disappointed that he has not been able to protect her. This is not a game, it's her life. It is a very clear message to the British press, back off. He says, my statement generated a whole new onslaught from my family. Pa and Willie were furious. They gave me an earful. My statement made them look bad, they both said. Why in hell? Because they'd never put out a statement for their girlfriends or wives when they were being harassed. Note the turnaround on Harry here. Why are they mad? Charles and William are mad because they're shitty husbands and Harry is a good husband and that makes them look bad. So they're not mad at Harry for what he did necessarily, right? At least that's not how it reads. They're mad because they fucked up and they want to scapegoat Harry. And they might, again, they might feel like, well, I wasn't allowed to. Maybe they did want to at some point and the press offices said, no, you can't put that out. Never complain, never explain. Maybe some men in gray suits kind of directed that, but there was nothing stopping Charles or William from being a decent human being and protecting their wives and girlfriends with a positive press statement or a statement of support for their girlfriends and wives. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. But now that they see that's an option, now they're mad at Harry for taking that option because they look bad in comparison. Talk, this is toxic, right? This is toxic thinking. They're, they want to get mad at Harry because they didn't do the right thing. They're not being introspective. They're not being reflective on the fact that they didn't stand by their girlfriends and wives. They just want to tell Harry that he's bad for doing it, even though he did the right thing, which they're kind of implying it is the right thing because they're saying, well, they didn't do that for their wives and girlfriends. So they're kind of tacitly admitting, well, maybe they should have. Maybe they shouldn't have sat by while their girlfriends were being harassed and should have like put a note out like, hey, it's bad to harass women, but they don't care. And also keep in mind that they're living in a fucking patriarchy straight out of the fucking 20th century. It seems like they don't even fully understand like how patriarchal they are. Basically their wives seem like an afterthought to their whole, whole grand scheme of things. They kind of are the central hub and they are meant to shield and protect their girlfriends. And they don't seem to think about how to how everybody could collaborate in that process. They seem to think of themselves as the heads and they make the, those decisions and they didn't make the right decision for their wives and girlfriends instead of framing it as, well, let's say William and Kate, for example. When Kate was getting harassed, William and Kate could have actually sat together and even maybe drafted a statement together and 
Or William could have said, well, do you want a statement put out? And they could have collaborated on that. And if he wanted to do it on his own, he could have. There's just, it, it seems like there's always this idea of like the men do things to protect their precious woman cargo or whatever, their, their precious woman property. That that seems to be how the, how the family really operates. And it's wild it's wild i mean this isn't the fucking 2020 like no it's like 2016 anyway we're firmly in the 21st century at this point we see that this is already starting to take a mental health toll on megan he talks about how megan will just like break down into tears sometimes and be like can they can they really do that can they really just lie about me can they really just make stuff up and harry's like yeah they can. The truth is, no, they can't. But the royal family members have been so like messed up in the brain that they don't pursue any legal action because they're fearful of the press and the press has got this hold on them. The truth is, no, uh, people cannot, journalists cannot just make stuff up about you and report it. They're only allowed to do that because the royal family has no balls to actually pursue legal action. But again, we see the mental mind prison that they're all stuck in. He also outlines Megan's like first time being in this like confrontational paparazzi situation. She tries to go down to Whole Foods and in her disguise and everything and just do a little bit of grocery shopping. And it's her first time going there and being like actively harassed in person. People being like, well, I'm just gonna take a photo of you. I'm just gonna follow you around the store. And she just comes home, breaks down into tears. We're seeing that escalation of not just the harassment that Megan is getting in the press or online, but this escalation of harassment in her real world. She's starting to become put more and more in danger, not having that security of being able to go out in public. Back when they were just courting and nobody really knew about them, it seemed like you just put on our disguises and we go out and we can just kind of live our some semi-normal life. And, you know, it's a little bit of planning involved, but not super, super difficult. Now it's like, no, she's actively being harassed in public. She's wearing a disguise. She's trying to go about her normal business, but it's starting to get to the point where people just won't let go because boundaries, which we've talked about a lot in here, the boundaries are so broken with the royal family. But again, we're seeing that this is definitely starting to take a, a mental health toll on Megan, where she's getting these new, more horrible, more horrifying experiences, and it's definitely hurting her and affecting her emotionally. Chapter 21 isn't really that interesting, the one part that I did really like about this chapter is talking about this concept of like blood and blue blood and royal blood. Harry comes to the obvious conclusion, right? Royal blood is not any different than anybody else's blood. This is in the reference to he's gone to like a World AIDS Day charity and stuff. And so he's getting blood drawn to show the process of testing for AIDS. He writes, I watched the blood spurt and remembered all the people, friends and strangers, fellow soldiers, journalists, novelists, schoolmates, who'd ever called me and my family blue bloods. That old shorthand for aristocracy, for royalty. I wondered where it had come from. Someone said our blood was blue because it was colder than other people's, but that couldn't be right, could it? My family always said it was blue because we were special, but that couldn't be right either. Watching the nurse channel my blood into a test tube, I thought, red, just like everyone else's. I thought that was really well described about how not only do people think almost that the royal family is special in this way and they have this blue blood, but there's also kind of a note here that the family themselves kind of perpetuates this myth among the family that th we are special. We're different from everybody else, which I think we kind of implicitly understand that the royal family must think that they're you know, special 
Otherwise, how could they perpetuate this hierarchy? But we really get this sense that like, yes, they are communicating amongst themselves to each other, to people like Harry growing up, that they are special. They are better than other people. That's literally the wrong message to send to people. You don't want to be teaching kids or anybody, right, that they're better and specialer than everybody else in the world. Do you want to teach, you know, that all human beings are unique and equal and, and deserving of human decency and kindness and respect? He's saying basically we didn't get that messaging, right? The, the family does genuinely think we have blue blood, we are better than everybody else. And he kind of makes this note at the end, he's kind of disillusioned with that. We are not different. He also makes this note about like, maybe our blood was blue because we're colder than anybody else. And I think that's really interesting as we've talked about throughout the book that the royal family seems very emotionally cold, emotionally distant. And so this idea of their blue blood being because they're inherently colder people, I think maybe it kind of explains why the royal family holds on to this idea of being so emotionally detached and maybe this idea that they associate being cold and emotionally distant with being blue-blooded, with being special and unique and better than other people. Regular, regular people, we just have emotions, right? That we go through and regulate and we feel things, but they shouldn't feel things, that they're superior beings, that they don't have those sorts of human emotions that mere mortals have, that they're colder and more formal and more distant and that's what makes them better. It's all fucked up. Like all, all of that is fucked up messaging, but we see that it, it sounds like they do genuinely believe that. At the end of this chapter, he also talks about Megan going back home to her family. And it, it's a little bit of a glimpse into the future, foreshadowing, as we always talk about, where Megan is talking to her father and it says, her father had brought an armful of tabloids, however, which he inexplicably wanted to talk about. That didn't go well and he ended up leaving early. We can already see there's this tension developing between Megan and her father now. We don't know the full story behind all of that and we're definitely not gonna get it. This is Harry's story, so we don't really see into Megan's side of things as much. The UK media, I truly believe, wanted my mom's side of my family to be the ones that all this drama could be stirred up with. And suddenly you just have my mom who's classy and quiet and there. And then you have the other side of my family that is just acting differently. But this is before they're even engaged and stuff. But we can see from early on that Megan's father starts to delve into this like world of the tabloids and being really maybe addicted to the tabloids or being addicted to this or potentially being manipulated by the tabloids and having tabloids reach out to him or when talk to him, which we do learn later on that does happen, right? But that somehow the sort of tabloid culture is sucking him in, whether that's with promises of money for access to information or stories about Megan, or if it's just this like genuine curiosity that people have and they get addicted to sort of tabloids and gossip, or if he doesn't fully understand the media landscape and so he's always bringing these stories that a lot of them are not true and then trying to confront Megan and ask if they are true, but it doesn't fully understand that the media is just lying and maybe that's what's happening. But there, there's definitely some sort of tension here where one, I get the sense that Megan's father didn't fully understand how the media works and therefore was easily manipulated by the system in a lot of ways, which ended up deteriorating his relationship with Megan, which is unfortunate. And that also he, he kind of becomes trapped in this. He becomes the media circle spectacle right? Because he seems really willing to like perform and give into this sort of tabloid culture. And he also, based on his connection to Megan, has sort of like clout 
that like a royal reporter or a royal expert wouldn't necessarily have. And so they want to manipulate him to fulfill that role. But it's interesting, we're seeing that that happened really early on, or at least we're starting to get glimpses of that really early on. It wasn't just an all sort of like, right before the wedding sort of thing, that this was slowly kind of building up. The way that it played out in public, it may have seemed really sudden, but we're kind of getting hints there that it was it was on its way and he was definitely getting sucked into the this media stuff. Almost as soon as their relationship became public and Megan was part of that sort of media story. Now, chapter two is the most scary part of this story in terms of, I think this chapter is really well done in the scene painting that it does, the connections that Harry can make to earlier parts of the book. And it's also a, a good explanation of why Harry becomes so worried about Meghan and the press and also that fear of being unsafe in public and how that's really tied in viscerally to his trauma with his mother and really viscerally affects how he starts to think about how his future is gonna play out with Megan in it and how they're gonna be protected from the paparazzi. And he starts to really see this, this is a growing concern for our safety. This scene is a really well told I think to explain the danger and the, and the, how terrifying it is and also how little support they can get really from the family or from the palace or from the institution as a whole and how little support they can get from the police. For some reason, when it's a celebrity, it's acted as if like the law doesn't exist. You become public property in a way. I think that, that that's something that I'm glad Harry kind of like is continuously advocating for in this book is like celebrities still have legal protections. They shouldn't be allowed to like fear for their lives constantly just because they are a public figure. Like where is the line? And we see that that line is being crossed continuously, but with no repercussions. Megan, she's still working on suits. She's driving home from a shoot and she says that she's starting to see that she's being followed, she's being tailed. So she calls Harry, who's still in the UK, and it says, it was winter, Canada, so the roads were ice. Plus the way the cars were spinning around her, cutting her off, running red lights, tailgating her, while also trying to photograph her, she felt sure she was going to be in a crash. She told herself not to panic, not to drive erratically, not to give them what they wanted. Then she phoned me. So she's already in this point where there's dangerous driving going on around her. And of course, car crash, is it's instantly connected to that trauma of losing Diana, right? Especially given the circumstances that it's paparazzi chasing her, doing unsafe things on the road. It seems like a recipe for that same thing to happen with Megan. If your mother died in that way, you would fear for that happening to another one of your loved ones too. And, and I mean, Harry has also talked about how his friend Henner has also died in a car crash, not due to the paparazzi, but that trauma is still very much real. And so when, if you were on that other end of the line and you got a call from your loved one saying, I'm being chased by the paparazzi, I'm, I feel like I'm gonna crash the car, I don't know what to do, that instantly wakes up in, in Harry again Again, this trauma about his mother. And how can I prevent that from happening? It's like he's right back there again, as if he has to give directions to his own mother almost in a way, because the situations are so similar. He tells her to drive to the nearest police station so that she can report this. She goes in the police station and the police officers basically say, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. Because you're a public figure, they're allowed to just follow you around, chase you around, take pictures of you. There's nothing to be done. So I would say to the police, if any other woman in Toronto right now said to you, I have six grown men who are sleeping in their cars around my house and following me everywhere that I go and I feel scared, wouldn't you say that it was stalking? And they said, yes, but there's really nothing we can do because of who you're dating. It's like, so I'm just supposed to live like this? He said, yeah, and then I got a death threat and then things changed because I needed to have security.
I was hired by NBC to take over the security for Megan. And this has been the most intense situation with the media. I mean, I've worked with uh, A-list celebrities before, high net worth families before. This blew the meter right out the water. If the police were actually doing their job and thinking about the law, being a public figure does not automatically make people running red lights or driving erratically or speeding or tailgating you doesn't make all of those things legal. So it's really bizarre that somehow they're gonna say, well, you're a public figure, what can you do? Um, driving erratically is still illegal. Um, why would they not want to intervene? It's a little bit of like, are we gonna put our conspiracy hats on here? Like, I don't wanna believe in some like deep conspiracy where the Toronto government is in cahoots with the royal family, but there's definitely some sort of, something's wrong here. Like at least something is really, really wrong here if police believe that they are allowed to allow people to stalk and harass other people just because they are celebrities. That doesn't make sense. He also mentions there was no real respite for Megan once she was inside her house. Like every previous night, paps and so-called journalists knocked at her door, rang the bell constantly. Her dogs were losing their minds. They couldn't understand what was happening, why she wasn't answering the door, why the house was under assault. As they howled and paced in circles, she cowered in the corner of her kitchen on the floor. After midnight, when things quieted down, she dared to peep through the blinds and saw men sleeping in cars outside, engines running. My house was just surrounded. Just men sitting in their cars all the time, waiting for me to do anything. I was hearing all of this from thousands of miles away and trying to do something about it, but being completely helpless. And my neighbors text me saying they're knocking on everyone's doors, they're trying to find you. They had paid certain neighbors to put like a live stream camera into my backyard. Suddenly it was like everything about my life was just getting so much more insular. Like all the curtains were pulled, all the blinds were pulled. Like it was scary. Imagine that you get chased down the road. You're being followed, you're being tailgated. You get to your house. You can't even live your normal life in your house. People are constantly coming up to your door trying to get in. Is feel is like a prisoner in her own home. And even after people stop coming up to the door and trying to agitate her to like come out and talk to them or do something, they're still there. They're still sleeping there, feeling like she can't leave. She can't go out. They're gonna instantly be following her wherever she goes. She can't even go into her own backyard without possibly being recorded. Let her dogs out. Like she really is becoming not just like a prisoner in her own home, but she can't even really fully move about her own property. Property. The police saying that there's nothing to be done, that somehow you're allowed to be stalked, you're allowed to be followed home, you're allowed to have somebody f watch you on the street and watch your house. And somehow the police are, are saying that it's not their responsibility to intervene is, is pretty crazy. I think it just very much speaks to people having very little empathy for people in these positions of privilege, like thinking, oh, you're a celebrity, you have all this immense privilege. But I think that we should still all, regardless of our wealth and status, feel like we're not having people follow us, like literally follow us around. Not only is this happening to Megan, it's also happening to Megan's mother. I felt unsafe a lot. I can't just go walk my dogs. I can't just go to work. You know, there was always someone there waiting for me, following me to work. I was being stalked by the paparazzi. Once I pulled over, and so he pulled next to me and he said, you know, I just been trying to get a story. Uh, you know, you can get a lot of money for this. And I just looked at him and think, this is my child. Like, I have nothing to say. 
And not only is it happening to Megan's mother, but it's also happening in a way that's also bringing on racist abuse. They call her trailer trash. They call her a stoner. This is very code, not so coded, but coded racist language. You shouldn't be racist. Like uh, even if you're a journalist, even if you're a journalist, even if you're a tabloid journalist, your story should not be infused with racism. It's all sorts of horror right? It's, it's a horror show. I don't think Harry fully got them prepared for, it, and I think didn't fully understand, right, the race angle to it until it happened. This isn't just them being stalked and harassed, right? I mean, that's definitely part of it. It's being stalked and harassed. And when they use those photos or when they run those stories, they're also using it as an opportunity to be racist. And, and not always, but sometimes to be racist, sometimes to be misogynistic, sometimes just to be abusive, is definitely not making the situation any better. He ends this chapter with a line that I really like that it ties back to, again, what we learned in part two. He talks about how Doria, Megan's mother, works in palliative care. So she helps to end people's lives respectfully and humanely, not to end their lives. She's not like a do euthanasia doctor. She help support them at the ends of their lives. There we go. Harry notes in the last paragraph, Paps scaled the walls and fences of many patients she visited. In other words, every day there was yet another person like mummy whose last sound on earth would be a click. I love that image. He's tying back again that idea of that last thing that his mother heard was the clicks of the paparazzi and that, that flash bulb and that being photographed in your in your last moments that you can't escape you can't have this quiet moment to yourself even in death him so desperately fighting against everything that that represents the stalking of the media the focus on not supporting people in their time of need, but instead photographing them and using them in publicity. Even though his mother was like beloved in some way, that she was also, even as she was dying, was being photographed for somebody else's greed and not actually wanting to support her. Thinking also about how his mother struggled with a lot of mental health issues and people were more focused on the pretty pictures of Diana and how they could market her and sell her and use her image for whatever anybody's interest was, whether to sell a story or to sell a commemorative plate or whatever it was, that getting in the way of actually providing support for someone that is going through pain right, and all the pain that Diana went through. I think this chapter shows a lot Harry understanding that he has put Megan and her mother through a lot of pain and he's putting her through almost the same thing that his mother has gone through and we see the being chased by the paparazzi being very similar this idea of the last sound on earth being a click at the end of this chapter how he really wants to set the tone that he doesn't want to be a part of that anymore and he doesn't want that to happen to his loved ones anymore and starting to be a little bit more serious about using his mother's legacy and what he's learned from his mother's death and trying to make it right in the future to actually protect Megan and protect her mother and to do the right thing and to speak up against this and to not allow the press to get away with it again, to set those boundaries. We see, I think, a shift of seeing, I do not want what happened to my mother to happen again. And therefore, if I don't want that to happen, I need to take decisive action to keep her safe, to do the right thing, to criticize the media that engages in this way, to sort of break the cycle, right, of that those boundaries being consistently crossed and therefore people getting hurt either physically or emotionally. I really like this chapter a lot. I think that it shows a big shift in Harry's perspective. And I think it will make a lot of sense why they make the decisions that they do where he says, I don't want my wife to go through this harassment again. I don't want this for my children. I've gone through it. 
I've seen my mother go through it. I want to break this cycle. How that leads him to make a lot of the choices that he made, but a lot of those choices go against the sort of conventional wisdom of the royal family and the way that they want to engage with the press. Is that because they are doing it deliberately because they think Harry is a nuisance or is it intentionally manipulative and abusive that they go against Harry or are they genuinely unaware of how hurtful they're being? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. At this point, it seems pretty intentional. I don't know. We'll keep reading. We'll keep reading. Yet a new day, yet another chance to discuss. We're starting to get into the juicier parts about how the family is reacting to Megan becoming more and more integral. As Harry is saying, she's the one, she's definitely the, the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. The family is slowly coming to the realization that Megan's not going anywhere. So getting into these chapters as we lead up to Harry actually proposing to Megan and asking her to be a part of their fucking freakish nightmare, we get more and more subtle clues about how the members actually felt about her and what their concerns were with her joining the family. Just to finish off chapter 24 here, so as the press is getting more and more invested in learning and discovering secret information about Megan and stalking and harassing her, Harry goes to his father at the end of chapter 24 to ask like, what can they do about this? She's starting to get more and more harassment. Charles's only thing that he can say is, don't read it, darling boy, a classic. But for once, Harry is not happy with this response. He's been hearing this response his entire life from his father, but in this case, this is a woman that he truly cares about, that he really considers potentially being the one, quote unquote. So for him, this response is not apt. He says it's already happening in slow motion, death threats. The production of suits is being affected by this. Her movements are being constantly surveilled. There is like a baked in level of curiosity and opinion dealing with royals that I have not seen before. The paparazzi started coming out to try to get eyes on her. And ugh, there were people trying to buy call sheets from like production assistants on our show so they could find out when she was shooting. They'd get these really long lenses and like hide on hills so that they could get a view of her. There were people breaking into the area where their trailers are and trying to get pictures of her coming in and out of her trailer. It started feeling a little bit dangerous for her. At a certain point, we had to cage in all the trailers, and that was really challenging logistically because she was on a TV show and her nature is to never make things more difficult for anyone. But I don't think anyone knew how to manage that new normal. So f this is starting to get to the point where Harry is just not happy with this never complain, never explain thought process when the love of his life is being harassed in this way. But Charles, yet again, he just says, I was overreacting. This is sadly just the way it is. This line of thinking that this is just the way it is definitely starts to get into the territory of abuse, right? It sounds like a lot of the other members of the royal family don't want to do anything because they feel like in the past they were barred from doing certain things. And so instead of trying to do things better the next time around, you know, in order to break generational curses and whatnot, they instead appeal to this, well, that's just the way it is. That's just the way things are done around here. We all had to go through this. Why can't you just shut up and go through it as well? Instead of actually thinking, well, maybe this is not an effective strategy. Harry tries to make that argument by saying, well, this is a really bad look on the monarchy, right? 
Like the paparazzi is going after this woman in not just like regular harassment, stalking sort of way, but actively being racist. The headlines, the stories that they're putting out about her are racist and sexist. It's misogynoir, right? So Harry is trying to get Charles to, to think like, look, this looks really bad on us if we don't call out racism. Like this looks bad. Charles is totally unmoved by this. Harry even says they, they being like the public, take it personally. You need to understand that. One other thing that I think the royal family wasn't very clear on is that when you don't call out racism, anybody that's a person of color is going to see the monarchy not supporting another person of color, right? And they're gonna take that personally because racism affects all people of color in the same way that misogyny in some ways affects all women. But they don't seem to understand that, right? that their press statements can have an impact on how people in those minority groups see them. They, they want to appeal to a very conservative, never complain, never explain demographic, but that demographic is pretty small. It's a very small part of the British public, right? There are a lot of British women. There are a lot of British people of color. There's a lot of British women of color, and they're gonna take it personally that the royal family is sitting idly by while there's all these racist headlines about somebody that m might be a part of the family one day. But they can't really see that. And I think another reason why they're not very moved to do anything about that is because we're gonna get hints that there are a lot of obstacles that may or may not have been placed in the way of Harry asking for Meghan's hand in marriage in making it official. There's a couple like obstacles that seem to have been slightly placed along the way that demonstrate that potentially the royal family was trying to discourage Harry from being with Meghan at every turn. In this moment, them being silent might have also been their way of kind of hoping that Meghan was gonna slowly disappear out of the picture and they wouldn't have to do anything about it. If she just gets harassed into oblivion, then that's some other thing that they don't have to deal with. They never for a moment actually suspect, hey, maybe Harry actually loves this woman. It just never occurs, it never occurs to them that maybe Harry is gonna be unmoved by Meghan's harassment. He's not gonna be bullied into not being with her anymore. Chapter 25. So Harry decides to go back to therapy after the big incident with Meghan that we don't get a lot of details on. This is the catalyst for him finally returning to therapy, tr giving it another go. One of the first things that he mentions to his new therapist is that he has this intense fear of losing his mother. And when he says lose, he really means like to lose the memory and the connection that he has to her in his own mind. And he starts to identify that all of the pain that he feels about the loss of his mother in some ways is a way to keep his mother's memory alive within himself. And he says, I suppose without the pain, well, she might think I've forgotten her. And I think that's true for a lot of people where they hold on to the pain of losing someone because they almost feel like it's an attack on their legacy if they don't continuously harbor that pain. They think that feeling that pain demonstrates the love that they felt for that person. And so they don't wanna let go of that pain because they worry that not having that pain is somehow tarnishing or diminishing the importance of that person in their life, which is, again, a very negative, horrible way of thinking, but is also a big part of grieving for somebody. When you, when you don't complete that sort of grieving process and come to terms with it and understand, okay, there are gonna be painful moments, but I shouldn't be like holding on to that pain constantly. And that you can immortalize the memory of somebody without having to like constantly self-flagellate with that pain. But Harry talks about how these memories of his mother were put behind a sort of quote unquote wall in his mind 
that he stuffed all of those things down. He suppressed all those memories of his mother. And so part of his healing process is really about letting that wall come down and being able to engage in a healthy way with memories of his mother. Right now, he's engaging with those memories in a very unhealthy way where he's constantly feeling pain and guilt and anger and frustration about her death and that rage of not being able to express himself after his mother's death. He's holding on to her in all these very negative and destructive ways. And part of his healing process is really about letting that wall come down so that he can actually engage with his memories of her in a positive way thinking about all of the good that she did, but also thinking about her as a more complex character. Instead of just engaging with the memories of her image or her photographs or the way that he puts it as she was mainly a hole in his heart, not engaging with her memory as just this crippling loss and this hole in his heart, but rather sort of healing that hole and, and having her have a space in his heart that's not going to be destructive, where he's not going to be constantly berating himself for not feeling the pain, for not crying about it, for not feeling like, quote unquote, like grieving enough or in enough pain to justify her death or, or whatever sort of like negative griefing process he's going through. In chapter 26, he also continues with this idea, again, discussing the rage that he felt. He ties this to the rage that he felt when he had this incident with Megan, which again, we don't get any details about, which I get it, I get it. it's very probably sensitive for both of them, but I, I wish there was some understanding, like what did he do? Like He also says that he vented about his family. He notes as well though, that when he vents about his family, he is constantly worried that somebody is gonna hear him talking about them. And then he also talks about that rage that he feels towards the press, that they're showing such contempt to Megan, somebody that he truly loves, and talks about how somehow it's hitting a bit different now because as he was growing up, he always sort of justified their treatment of him by saying, well, I was born into this, this is my role. He also says that sometimes he brought this on himself. So there's a little bit of like victim blaming here as well, like self victim blaming. But when he sees it done to Megan, he's like, well, what did Megan do to deserve this, right? She wasn't born into this. She didn't bring this on herself. She hasn't done anything wrong and yet, the way that they're treating her is in this horrible, vile, and cruel way when she doesn't deserve it. And so I think this also shows how Harry accepted a lot of abuse from the press. He was very critical of the press and he always felt this contempt for them, but that he was able to sort of explain it away and in some ways was kind of gaslit by other people in the family or from the press into believing that he's kind of deserved it in a way. But seeing it happen to another person, seeing it happen to somebody that he really cares about, that he truly loves deeply, is starting to trigger something in his mind where I think he's starting to realize, well, Megan doesn't deserve that type of abuse. Why should I deserve that type of abuse? He also talks about how this is a very common complaint from the press. This idea that Meghan and Harry are pretending to want privacy, that they ask for privacy, which I don't know if they've ever specifically asked for privacy other than like they've said that like there's stuff that they want to share with the world and that they don't want to share with the world. I think life is about being able to share our stories and share parts of our lives that you're comfortable with. There's no one who's on Instagram or social media that would say, because I shared this one picture that entitles you to have my entire camera roll, go ahead, look through it. No one would want that. So it's about boundaries and it's about respect. They've created a false narrative. We, I mean, I've never talked about privacy. Mm -hmm. I think that's just a basic understanding. There's this idea that they are pretending to want privacy and that that's somehow hypocritical because they are in the public eye. Those two things do not conflict with each other. The problem is that there's a false dichotomy that's created when people in the public eye talk about privacy. Either that you want privacy 
and therefore should not have any public platform whatsoever, or that you don't want privacy because you're in the public eye and therefore everything in your life should not be private. Everything should be in the public domain. That doesn't make any fucking sense, right? Think about that for two seconds. For example, I have a public platform. I'm putting out YouTube videos into the public space. Does me creating a video mean that I don't want privacy in terms of not doxing myself, not telling you too many personal details, not talking about other people in my life that have not asked to be a part of these videos. No, right? There's the part of me that I want to share, my thoughts and opinions on Spare, for example, and there's parts of my life that I don't want to share, that I want to be private. I want privacy about some things in my life. So this idea of somebody saying that you only pretend that you want privacy makes no sense because privacy is not an on or off switch. There are things in our life that we are happy to be open about, and there are things in our life that we want to be private. It's There's no contradiction here. You can't pretend to want privacy. It's not like, if you want privacy on something, that being in public in any way is a contradiction to your want for privacy. He also discusses, again, this isn't just, I want privacy, I don't want you to know every single little detail about my life. This is, I don't want people to write death threats saying that they're going to kill me. Like, that. That seems pretty reasonable. I don't think that's about privacy. I think that's really about people shouldn't fear for their life. It's bad. That's bad, right? That's bad. <laughs> so he's recounting all of this at therapy. The therapist talks about how this is really a manifestation of the trauma of 12 year old Harry, that the anger that he's feeling and expressing is coming from this traumatized little boy within him, right? That's still lashing out about everything that's happened since his mother's passing, and that that wound not being healed is meaning that he is acting in destructive ways because of the pain that he is in and the pain that he's gone through. And he talks about this idea of like, oh, that seems a bit rude to say that I'm like a child. I think that that's really interesting because I think a lot about therapy is about thinking about your inner child and thinking about your past traumas especially childhood traumas if you have them. And so I think that that is something that people who have not gone to therapy do struggle with when they first get into therapy is this constant talk about your childhood and your, your inner child. I think it, it is something that people are uncomfortable with. I actually saw this clip from What's His Face on LBC talking about when he first started going to therapy and he was like, I'm never gonna talk about my inner child. I'm not gonna be sitting here telling my inner child stuff. That's naff, right? I wish you could hear me 10 years ago. I, I, I had a fraction of the listeners that I've got now. So the massive majority of people listening now will not have heard me 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I used to laugh my socks off at this sort of stuff. What a load of bilge. Oh, oh, I've got to go and talk to my therapist. I, I, I swear to you, I, I would have been at the front of the queue of people absolutely poo-pooing the idea that talking about your inner child or making contact with the, with the brutalised infant that you used to be would in some way uh, allow you to make enormous changes to your adult life. Uh, unbelievable, really. Dif and I think Harry would have been like that as well, don't you? When he was tooling around the place behaving like... Uh, a, a super entitled little git. I, 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 it's not his own language, but some of the stories he shares, you know, I, I think he would have been like that as well. But I, I ended up in therapy for, for a heap of reasons. I, I write about it in my last book. I couldn't believe it. So I went to therapy more in hope than expectation. And I, I, the therapist said to me, if this works and if we decide to work together, then at some point in the near future, I will ask you to talk to, let's say, 10 year old you. We sort of trace back some of the some of the reasons why you are how you are. We'll trace it back to when you were 10, say, or 11 or 12. And I'll ask, I thought she was bonkers. I remember sitting there trying not to laugh, like literally trying not to laugh. I said, sorry, we're going to do what? And she said, what we'll probably use, we'll probably use that cushion over there. And you, when, you know, when, when we're making progress, if we do decide to go ahead with this, then you will talk to that cushion as if it is your 10 year old self. And then we had a crack at it. Then we had a go at, at therapy. And within 
two sessions. Within two sessions, it happened. I was talking about being beaten as a kid at school, formally, not the informal beatings, but when you would go and queue up outside your headmaster's study and you'd go in one by one. And the worst bit was that you'd hear, you'd hear your mate getting whacked. You'd hear your mate getting caned. Now, this is going back to the, to the early 1980s. It doesn't happen now. And, and the effort that you immediately put into pretending that it doesn't hurt is almost impossible to convey. You have to convince yourself that it doesn't hurt. If you don't convince yourself that it doesn't hurt, physically, emotionally, mentally, you are almost proud of it. If you don't convince yourself that you're fine, then you'll fall apart. That's what Harry's talking about when he talks about not crying when his mum died and watching documentaries trying to teach himself how to cry. He has turned, he turned himself into an automaton. I, I, I am not in pain. I am not vulnerable. I am not fragile. It did not hurt. And what is the bedrock of the British royal family? What's the bedrock of the British class system? All together now? Yeah. The stiff upper lip. What is the opposite of emotional health? The stiff upper lip. So that's what happened to him. I know it happened to him because it happened to me on a much smaller scale. And I'm talking about it and I'm talking to the, to the woman about being beaten. And she goes, how old were you again? I said, I was 10. And, and she said, well, that must have hurt. And straight away, I start going, no, it didn't. And, and for some reason in that moment, she said, that must have really hurt. And I went, yeah. Yeah, it really did. I mean, it, it really, re I was 10, you know. I was tiny. He was six foot three and he had a special tool designed for hitting children with. And, and I just stopped right there. And she did it immediately. She turns, she goes, tell him now. And points at this bloody cushion on a sofa. I'm supposed to talk to the cushion. It felt like the most natural thing in the world. I remember 10 years ago, I'd have been laughing my socks off at the idea of therapy being good for people. And she said, she said this thing that I'll never forget. She said, tell him he's all right now. Tell him that you will look after him. Understand this, you understand Prince Harry. All of it, even if he's getting on your nerves, even if you don't understand why he's doing what he's doing, even if you think he's, he's gone too far or he shouldn't have done this, but you understand why he did that. Understand this and you will understand Prince Harry. You turn to your brutalized 10, 11, 12 year old self and you say, I will look after you now. 27, he talks more about the connections he makes in therapy about his mother's legacy and his healing that he needs to go through. He very aptly observes that Willie and I had often turned women into surrogate moms. Wasn't that the whole theme of the book? Didn't we talk about this? All these times when we talked about Freudian stuff with like Tiggy or the, the mums away from mums at, at his school. The reason why they turn these women into surrogate mums is because they never fully processed the loss of their actual mother. And so they were constantly seeking for that sort of maternal vibe from all the women that they met. But he also talks about how that turning women into surrogate moms also was a bit destructive in its own right because then he would start to feel guilt about this feeling of, oh, maybe I'm replacing my mother. Maybe this is a slap in the face to her legacy if I find that sort of maternal instinct in somebody else. And he also starts to realize that his mother in some ways wasn't a perfect mother, right? That she, she had a lot of positive qualities to her, but it wasn't like she was this perfect example of a mother. She was a flawed human being. He talks about how in some ways she over-mothered in a lot of situations. When she was with the boys, she was very overprotective of them, or maybe not overprotective, but she was very protective of them, very nurturing to them, gave them lots of gifts, lots of praise, lots of hugs, lots of attention, but then would also be gone for long parts of the time. Part of that was probably also after the divorce that she would disappear for long periods of time, maybe because the family kind of cut her off in some ways. And so maybe she felt like she had to disappear. But in other cases, that was a choice that she made, right? But he talks about again, how that realization that his mother maybe wasn't a perfect mother brings on even more guilt. That again, that questioning anything about 
his mother or her legacy or or his memory of her is somehow a, a betrayal of her. Harry still feels like if he doesn't think about his mother in a particular way, or he doesn't feel pain thinking about her, he sort of trained himself to turn that into guilt. If I connect with another woman that's not my mother, I should feel guilt for that. If I question my mother's parenting decisions, I should feel guilt for that because she's no longer here. If I think about the legacy of her life and how she was exploited and feeling guilt about that and feeling like I didn't do enough, right? That he feels that guilt. So again, he needs to retrain his brain in a way to not turn everything related to his mother into this painful process, into this feeling of guilt and shame. It's not healthy for him. It's not, it's not helping to have a better relationship with the memory of his mother. We talked about life inside the British bubble, inside the royal bubble, a bubble inside a bubble impossible to describe to anyone who hasn't actually experienced it. People simply didn't realize. They heard the word royal or prince and lost all rationality. Ah, a prince, you have no problems. They assumed, no, they'd been taught. It was all a fairy tale. We weren't human. A writer many Britons admired, a writer of thick historical novels that racked up literary prizes had penned an essay about my family in which she said we were simply pandas. Our current royal family doesn't have the difficulties in breeding that pandas do, but pandas and royal persons alike are expensive to conserve and ill-adapted to any modern environment. But aren't they interesting? Aren't they nice to look at? I'll never forget the highly respected essayist who wrote in Britain's most highly respected literary publication that my mother's early death spared us all a lot of tedium. He referred in the same essay to Diana's tryst in the underpass. But this panda crack always struck me as both acutely perceptive and uniquely barbarous. We did live in a zoo, but by the same token I knew as a soldier, that turning people into animals, into non-persons, is the first step in mistreating them, in destroying them. If even a celebrated intellectual could dismiss us as animals, what hope for the man or woman on the street? I think this part is very perceptive of Harry, and I'm glad that he vocalized this in the book. He notes that perception that people just lose their minds when they hear something like royal, but he also, even more perceptively says that people have been taught to think in that way. That gets into the propaganda piece, right? The press in conjunction with the royal family who is trying to perpetuate this image creates the branding of the fairy tale. And if we know anything about the royal family in their sort of like rebranding efforts and their constant changes with their relationships to the press, then we know that over the course of the 20th century is when the royal family started to show things like coronations and royal weddings and put those things out into the public and present them as these magical fairy tales in order to bring the public in to the spectacle and make it all shiny. Like you said, make it look like a fairy tale, right? Thinking about the type of publicity that the royal family got, for example, at the wedding of Charles and Diana, they learned very quickly that they can capitalize on that fairy tale image and branding these ceremonies as this big happily ever after, or as this sort of magical moment, that that positivity could translate into positive PR for the royal family and make them more likable in the eyes of the public. When they have better publicity and they look better in the eyes of the public, people are less likely to wanna to call for the guillotine, not me. But it also has the effect of allowing the public to dehumanize the royal family members themselves by seeing them as a sort of 
magical curiosity behind the fence. This idea of we get to watch the spectacle, we get to watch them behind the glass and point and look at them and go, ah, oh, isn't that a bit peculiar? Aren't they interesting? Isn't that cool? And we get to like enjoy like a barbecue and a day drinking bender for their wedding and sort of like lounge and relax at the curiosity of it all because it's so quaint, it's so unlike our modern day life. In doing so, we've reduced them in some ways to these sort of zoo animals. We keep them in this very rigid, small confined space so that we can look at them and go, ah, oh, aren't they pretty? We've been so conditioned to not seeing them as human beings as seeing them as this sort of mythos, this fairy tale. Chapter 28, Harry is starting to think again back. He's reflecting on a lot of his trauma and he's finally able to kind of unlock some memories about his mother that aren't negative, that he, he actually gets to enjoy some of the positive things that he kind of blocked out because he didn't want to think too much about his mother. So he starts ta telling stories about memories that are coming back to him. He talks about smelling her perfume and feeling like smelling that perfume brought back memories of her and he got to enjoy those. His mother used to stuff sweets into his socks and he said outside sweets were forbidden. Outside sweets are forbidden in the royal family? Think about that. Think about all the, all the sweet, all the, all the candy that you eat. You can't have any of that in the royal family. Why? Like, why? Like, literally why? Again, I feel like the royal family just makes up rules so that people can get in trouble for them. He makes that connection with his mother stealing those sweets and hiding them in his socks to at the beginning of the book when he would talk about grub days. And, how, and when they would get candy at school and how he like loved all of that. And he makes that connection. Oh, my mother used to do this with me and I used to think it was really naughty. And then I used to love these times when we get these outside candies. And again, it was something that he never could make the connection about. So again, that just shows like some of the positive steps that Harry can do to sort of recontextualize everything in his life now that he's working on his mental health. He also talks about though, that this also brings back a lot of negative memories in terms of thinking about him, Willie and his mother were driving around in cars being traced by the paparazzi. How he witnessed his mother just weeping in the car as she's trying to evade these paparazzi and they keep clicking their cameras, trying to get a photo of them. And that helps him to make a little bit more of a connection about why he hates the paparazzi so much. To make those connections back to his mother. Oh, I feel this intense hatred for the paparazzi, not just because they killed her, right? But also because I actually saw those tears. I actually saw the pain that she was in. And he kept that memory of the pain in some ways, but maybe necessarily didn't think about where that pain originated from. Chapter 29, we kind of snap away from all of the therapy stuff and snap back into discussing the sort of logistics of Megan integrating into the family a little bit more. This time, Harry is approaching his family after Megan had paid thousands of dollars of legal fees to get the son to correct his story, claiming that she was on Pornhub, which we didn't really talk about, but the son ran an article basically insinuating that she was a porn star of some kind, when in fact, it was just a clip from Suits that had a sex scene in it that was uploaded to Pornhub by a different user. Like, But again, they just use anything anything in their power to get a headline that makes no sense. Megan fights this case on her own, no money from the royal family or anything to help suppress this story. Harry calls his father to talk about what can they do about the harassment of the press and all the negative and malicious stories coming out. What do you think Charles is gonna say? He just says, don't read it. But Harry, at this point, he is done with this. Like. He's been hearing this excuse his entire life. He's realized going through all of this with a person that he realizes is completely innocent in this situation, how bullshit that argument actually is. Not reading the story does nothing to stop the actual pain that it's causing to Megan and to Harry to read stories that are patently untrue 
and to know that those stories are being disseminated to a public that will happily drink it all up and believe it. Harry decides to try to approach his father in a little bit of a different way. He instead tries to remind Charles that he went through all of this with the press and why doesn't he feel that sort of anger at the press who has been, he says, quote, portraying him as a clown all of his life, ridiculing him for sounding the alarm about climate change. These were his tormentors, his bullies, and now they were tormenting and bullying his son and his son's girlfriend. Did that not inspire outrage? So now he tries to appeal to Charles's emotions and go, these people, why, they're not your friends, right? The, these people have tormented and abused you. Harry is in some ways pointing out the sort of generational trauma here. The press has abused Charles, has abused William. They have gone after Harry. They're now going after Meghan. So Harry, without using the word, is discussing the generational trauma and is saying, why does that not spark any outrage in you that this is continuing to happen? And this is happening to people that you love, right? Or supposedly love. You like Megan. You've met, you've had a great time. You think she's a good girl, right? I'm your son. I would hope that you love me and want to support me and, and hope nothing but the best for me and for Megan. So why is nothing being done? Instead of the perspective of, oh, I went through this and I never want this to happen to anyone ever again because it's painful and I know the pain of it. It's the sort of self-interested, self-centered thinking of, I went through it and I turned out fine. So what are you complaining about? You just have to go through all of the pain that I went through because I haven't fully reconciled all the pain that I went through. So instead, I'm just gonna allow that pain to be inflicted on other people. As Harry is reaching out to his father for support, Megan tries to reach out to Camilla for support, hoping that maybe the sisterhood will hold up better. I don't know if Camilla's part of the sisterhood, but Megan tries. In those conversations with Camilla, Camilla basically tells Megan that this is just how it's done. The press is just gonna harass you and abuse you for a little bit of time, but that it'll all pass. You know, they'll, go to, they'll get over it eventually. And Camilla says, that she had been the bad guy once. He says the implication being what? Now it was Meg's turn? As if it were apples to apples. Now, Harry doesn't explain too much why this comparison is really bad, but let, let me explain what Harry is saying here as to why this is a terrible argument. When Camilla joined the royal family, she was Prince Charles's mistress. She and Prince Charles had been having an affair throughout Charles's marriage to Diana. This affair started before he married Diana and continued throughout their marriage and eventually led to Prince Charles's divorce. It also led to Camilla's divorce, who was also married at the time. And when Charles wanted to get together with Camilla, this was after Charles's ex-wife Diana had been horrifically killed in a car accident. So when Camilla entered the royal family, the situation was that she was literally the other woman in an affair and was coming into the family after a beloved ex-member, Princess Diana, who was a generally beloved figure and Prince Charles was demonized for his treatment of her, rightfully so, because he abused her in many different ways. And not only that, she was complicit in the abuse that Diana suffered. So when Camilla entered the family, her being treated poorly by the press, we could say that that was maybe a little bit of a you reap what you sow kind of situation. Like, she was literally an adulteress. She was cheating on her own husband with a prince that was married to a very beloved princess. So she was the bad guy. Like she was one of the bad guys in that situation. So the press being negative about her, pretty unsurprising, right? Pretty unsurprising why they would have a negative spin on it. When Meghan entered the royal family, what did Meghan do? Meghan's crime was being black 
and dating Harry. Those are the those are the two things that that anybody could say. So for Camilla to say, oh well, I was the bad guy once, and you know, look at me, like they got over it eventually. Camilla actually was the bad guy. Megan, on the other hand, didn't do anything wrong. She was literally a successful actress, entrepreneur, living her best life, doing charity work, running her own businesses. Like she literally wasn't doing anything. And for them to try to say, well, this is just the price that you pay. Why does Megan have to go through that? Maybe Camilla had to go through that because she had to suffer the consequences of her actions. But why should Megan have to suffer racist abuse? These things, these things are one of these things, not like the other, you know? Like another interesting point here is that Harry says, quote, Camilla also suggested to Meg that I become governor general of Bermuda, which would solve all our problems by removing us from the red hot center of the maelstrom. This is an interesting line because based on what, what happens later in the book, one of the ways that Harry and Meghan try to extract themselves from this sort of negativity of the press is that they try to find somewhere else in the Commonwealth for them to move so that they're not right in the center of London getting harassed by paparazzi all day that they could be connected to the royal family by living in a commonwealth country and doing other royal duties throughout the commonwealth but could avoid the sort of royal rota press craziness we'll we'll get to what happens when they try to do that the implication of this part here is that this wasn't even harry and megan's idea this was Camilla's idea. So when we hear later on that their idea of moving to a Commonwealth nation gets blocked in multiple ways by the royal family, secretly leaking things to the press, that makes the whole thing even more confusing and potentially pointing to more abuse than we would think it would be because the implication here is that it wasn't even their idea. It was Camilla's idea and so they got punished for trying to do what Camilla told them to do. But they were just mad because they didn't do it in the way that they wanted them to do it. Again, that whole, when you try to exert your boundaries with abusive family members, that's when they rack up the abuse. When Camilla mentions it, it's okay. Then it's a good idea. When they try to take that idea and do it in their own way, that's a bad idea they have to be stopped at all costs. So then Harry tries to talk to William about the whole thing. He vents to William, William says, oh, nobody believes that stuff. Harry's like, yeah, they do. Like we, we see the consequences of this. Here's the steps of the abuse tactics, okay, for gaslighting royal family members. The first is to say, don't read the negative story as if not reading the negative story means that there are no bad consequences for the misinformation or the negative stories or the racist stories. We know that that makes no sense. The second step is to say, well, people read these stories, but they don't believe them. Oh, how could they believe them? They're so crazy, nobody could believe them. This argument makes literally no sense either because in a world where all of us are on the internet, I think we all know somebody that is a conspiracy theorist or believes misinformation, falls down the rabbit hole and believes tons of things that are not true because they are ignorant or they they're misinformed or they read something that is intentionally misinformation or disinformation and they truly believe those things right so we all have experience of people believing things that are not true but for some reason when it comes to negative stories about the royal family the royal family members try to convince other royal family members that nobody believes these stories which can't be true right because there's got to be people out there that believe things that they read because they're just dumb right like we also no, we have evidence that it's not true because if people didn't believe those things, why would Harry and Meghan be getting, say, death threats, for example? Why would anybody send a death threat or reference things from these stories in their harassment? That person 
wouldn't say that to Megan if they didn't believe that the stories were true. It's still been under the delusion that if it was in a tabloid, no one believed it. Like, it's a tabloid. And then we had a walkabout in Liverpool. I mean, there was a group of women. And one of them said to me, what you're doing to your father's not right. It was the first time that I went, oh my God, people actually believe this stuff. And then my entire center was rocked to its core. People wouldn't say racist comments about Megan if there was an environment in which, say, the royal family didn't condone the racist rhetoric of the press, for example, right? People would be less likely to just spew that out in the open or send that directly to the royal family if the royal family set a boundary and said, we don't tolerate that here. The evidence that they're getting from the, the consequences of these stories is not matching what the royal family members are telling themselves. They're gaslighting each other or trying to gaslight each other into thinking that all of this is okay so that people don't speak up and do something about it. Because if those people do something about it, there's this fear that the press will retaliate in some way. And that's no way to live. A really interesting scene at the end of this chapter as well. William starts talking to Harry saying that he's starting to feel like Diana's presence with them. William kind of says like, I feel that she's here, which, which is a very sweet moment. This is a part where they can like bond with this, with this idea and talk about their mom more openly. Harry says, yeah, I feel her too. William talks about how I feel like she's been guiding my life. I feel like she's been setting things up for me, which looking at what we've seen in the book is a lot of what Harry has also been feeling too. This idea that Diana's spirit has been guiding him, influencing him. These coincidences that he always mentions about, you know, things related to his mother and positive things that happen in his life. It seems like we're about to get this very close bonding moment. The boys have finally broken through all the tensions in their relationship and are finally able to come to terms with talking about their mother, discussing her and her presence in their life. But Harry, trying to relate to his brother says, I felt that our mother brought Megan to me, that she helped me find Megan. Megan. Willie took a step back. He looked concerned. That seemed to be taking things a bit far. Well, now, Harold, I'm not sure about that. I wouldn't say that. So suddenly we get a lot of defensiveness from William. The book is a little unclear about how William actually feels about Megan. We seem to get a lot of conflicting info but that's probably because William himself is a very conflicted man. On the one hand, I think that William doesn't mind Megan as a person, as an actress, um, as someone that's in the celebrity realm. I don't think he has a problem with her. What I think starts to become his big issue is that William, let's, let's remember as well, is also dealing with that scared little boy that lost his mother and has not truly reconciled all of his thought process on that. In this moment, we kind of see a glimpse where William kind of gets mad that Harry has his own interpretation of his mother and her legacy. Harry interprets his mother and her legacy as being happy with Megan and his mother's spirit is in Megan. And that by being with Megan, Harry will become closer and closer to his mother and her spirit and truly embrace all of the positive aspects of her life and legacy, incorporate that into his own life and make him a happy, healthier person by also finding the companionship in Megan and going off and living their life together. William seems to not like that interpretation whatsoever. That might be because he's very protective of his mother's image. It might be because he fears that thinking too much about Diana in that way will be bad for the royal family as a business, as the firm. It might be jealousy from Harry that he feels jealous of the bond that Harry and Meghan have in some way, and that that causes him to lash out in this moment at Harry. It could also be related to what I said before, this idea 
that there might secretly have been this desire for Harry not to get married because again of all the things that it, when somebody new comes into the royal family all of the attention that that could get them all the prestige that that could get Harry, that concern about Harry and Meghan stealing the spotlight, you know, from William and Kate. A little bit difficult to interpret in this moment, but we definitely are starting to see that tension here. Harry is trying to be vulnerable with his brother and say, I'm becoming a happy, healthier person and Meghan makes me a happy, healthier person because I believe that it's, you know, the continuation of my mother's legacy and all that. And William basically saying, fuck your feelings, <laughs> fuck your happiness. I don't care. That's not my interpretation of my mother's legacy. And therefore you don't get to have your own interpretation of our mother's legacy. Chapter 30, Meg finally comes back for a visit. He talks about how he just got this feeling being with her again that their house was just full of love, describes them being able to like walk around the garden together. He's, he's retelling all these memories and stories about his childhood to her. Again, it seems like he's becoming more vulnerable and opening up to Megan. We saw in those earlier chapters that Harry was very um, hesitant to say anything about his family. Now we see that he's able to talk about his actual childhood and the memories that he has. He actually points to a garden that him and Willie used to play together in when the house was his mother's house. He mentions that it now belongs to Princess Michael of Kent, the racist one. <laughs> I'm guessing this is foreshadowing too. But then we see Harry for the first time says, I love you to Meghan. She says it back to him. Very cute, shows how far their relationship has come. It also becomes sort of the catalyst for that final reckoning. This is a forever commitment. This is going to become something long-term. So if this is becoming long-term, there needs to actually be a discussion of what that means, what it looks like to join the royal family. He worries that this is gonna be Meghan's moment to fucking bolt out of there but thankfully Megan really wants this to work out too and so it ends on this semi positive note well positive for this part of the story not very positive later on they are finally taking that step together and finally Harry is realizing that he needs to communicate about the firm aspect the firm of the royal family. He can't just skirt around it anymore. Here's what our life is gonna look like. Chapter 31, after they make this commitment, they finally have their first like official, official public outing. They go to the Invictus Games in Toronto, which works out very well because Megan at this time is still living in Toronto. It's very interesting as well that they are kind of happy about doing this public outing because they are hoping that by doing this sort of official engagement, this will finally reduce the sort of bounty on their head for surreptitious photos of them. Because if their relationship is public, right, and they get public photos together out in the open, that reduces the price of these paparazzi photos of them together. But Harry does know when this gets reported, the press, starts to say that Megan is breaking protocol or doing something wrong because she wore ripped jeans to this event. He mentions kind of ominously at the end, no one mentioned that everything she wore down to the flats and the button down shirt had been pre-approved by the palace and by no one, I mean not anyone at the palace. One statement that week in defense of Meg, it might have made a world of difference. Let's think about how fucked up this is, right? So you're Megan, you go to the palace and you say, what am I allowed to wear at this outing? You, you bring your clothes and you say, here, I'm thinking of wearing this outfit. Does this look good to you? You go to the palace, the palace goes, check, good. All that looks really good, out you go. The press comes back and says, Megan did a very naughty thing. This looks, this looks bad on the royal family. She wore ripped jeans to this event. If the palace approved what of what she wore, 
wouldn't it make a lot of sense for the palace to just come out and say, we're not offended by what Meghan wore. We approved it. Would that really have killed them? Meghan did everything right. She got her whole outfit approved by the palace. Then when she got criticism for what she wore, the palace stayed completely silent and decided to make everybody think that Meghan herself made some sort of faux pas or broke some sort of royal protocol that she never actually broke. She broke royal protocol by even though she and Harry are not yet married. And then on top of that, with the press, there's a lot of invented protocols. It was baptism by fire. Why would the palace not say anything about that? Why, why would they want people to think that she broke royal protocol when she didn't? And the answer is, this sounds like a setup, right? Like, this, this sounds like a deliberate setup. They told her, oh yeah, everything's gonna be cool. And then when everything wasn't cool, they just let her suffer the consequences. That sounds intentional, doesn't it? That sounds like a setup. So then the question becomes, why is the palace trying to intentionally set up a member of their own family. Take your pick, take your pick. One of these reasons. I'm not saying it's any of these reasons, but these are, all, these are the only reasons I can think of. And that's gonna be a running theme, right? Because I think what Harry is insinuating about the royal family is a lot more bold-facedly abusive. Like, you know, he's encircling the main idea, but he doesn't really fully outright state the main idea. But the problem here is that it becomes more and more obvious that it sounds like maybe this is some sort of deliberate attempt to manipulating Megan into leaving or having a mental breakdown and leaving the family or leaving Harry because she can't deal with it. And if that was their plan, to like break Megan's spirit or like destroy her life. Again, that seems very manipulative. It looks like abuse. It looks like pretty abusive. It's not a great look, but the public doesn't get to know that because they get to enjoy the press coverage, but not get to think about who's actually in control of the narrative here. They can believe that whatever news outlet that they're reading is in control of the story and that when the palace doesn't comment on something that that's just the way that they are. But we know now that from what Harry has said that the press actually works with the royal family pretty regularly and the royal family can basically tell them to write whatever they want. So when they don't comment on something or they don't correct the record on something, it's pretty telling. Yet another obstacle towards this forever commitment for Harry and Meghan. Harry tells his handlers that he wants to propose to Meghan. This shouldn't really be a shock to anybody in the royal family circles because it sounds like Harry has been pretty clear that he loves Meghan, that he's been doing a lot to show his support for Megan. He gets told by his handlers that there are rules about proposing. It's interesting that Harry doesn't know anything about these rules, considering that I as a layperson know this rule, but nobody ever thought to tell Harry this rule in 30 something odd years of his life. So they tell him that Harry has to ask the queen for permission to propose to Megan because anybody that's within a certain like distance in the line of succession has to ask the queen's permission to marry. Harry asks like, is this like a real rule or is this like a rule that like we can kind of like, you know, work something out, right? Like, do I literally have to go ask granny for permission to ask Megan? And they go, oh no. That's, that's like a real rule. That's legit, you know, a law. Harry is finally willing to like question all of this bullshit old traditional stuff. And he's like questioning, I'm a grown ass man and I have to ask my grandma to go get married. So he starts thinking about this and he's like, I couldn't recall Willie asking before he proposed to Kate. Now keep in mind, he didn't actually really know anything about William and Kate planning to get married anyway. It sounds like that kind of came out of the blue for him, but he's like, I don't remember that being a thing. He does vaguely remember one of his cousins having to ask. He also remembers his father having to ask about marrying Camilla. From these three examples that he gives, 
it paints potentially a picture that this is a rule that seems to be selectively enforced when there is contention about somebody marrying someone. So it sounds like potentially this rule was kind of loosey goosey when William wanted to ask Kate because Kate wasn't really a contentious choice, but that his father had to ask about Camilla because, I mean, Camilla was a very contentious choice. In terms of Peter and Autumn, it sounds like this Peter that he's referring to is Princess Anne's son, Peter Phillips, who wanted to marry a woman named Autumn who was a Canadian and was also Catholic. And I think those two red flags were probably part of the reason why they were like, oh, we gotta get the queen's permission. There's something a little bit spicy about that. She's gotta be part of the Church of England. We're still gonna pretend this whole divine right of kings thing. We're like, we're still gonna play that? We're still gonna play that game. And I think it just reinforces this idea where he says like, is this a real rule? And I think the answer is no, it's not really a rule if they have no problem with who you're gonna marry. If there's gonna be a problem, then they make you jump through these hoops to kind of make it sound like, do you really want to go through with this? Do you really want to do it? Because you got to go ask the queen. You got to like drag your ass up there and try to get her alone to ask. There's no other reference to people having to make this request other than he mentions later on, as he's kind of processing this rule that he now has to go ask his grandmother, he's told that yes, actually this request has been denied in the past by the queen herself. And he's like, what? Really? He's told for, it sounds like the first time in his life that the queen had denied Princess Margaret her choice in who she wanted to marry because he was a divorcee. He finally goes, oh shit, I thought, this might not be a slam dunk. It's one of those things where he didn't even know this rule existed. And then he goes, okay, well, maybe this is just like a ceremonial thing, you know, like I asked the queen, she says yes, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes, oh, fuck. Like the queen can actually say no. Like that can actually halt the entire process. The love of my life, I could just be told, no, you can't, you can't marry her. I think that's the first part where Harry starts to realize, oh, like my family has an inordinate amount of control over my life. I can be in love with a person and be told straight up by my grandma. Nope, you, you don't get to be happy. You don't get to do that. It's also a good comparison here that he talks about Princess Margaret. He's talked previously in the book about how he didn't really get to know Princess Margaret as much and that he could have bonded with her over this idea of them being both spares. And so I think that also kind of perks Harry's ears up because he thinks about how the other spare, right? The Princess Margaret, right? The other spare has also been denied her, the love of her life for wanting to marry a divorcee. And I think Harry is kind of worried about that generational trauma repeating itself. This also brings up the whole Duke of Windsor thing with Edward VIII wanting to get married to an American divorcee. Chapter 33, Harry starts to pinpoint how he's gonna ask his grandmother. He decides that he's going to ask her when they go on a shooting trip as a family. As he's getting ready for this day, chapter 33, I will say, is probably one of the best chapters in terms of not only the writing, but also fitting all the pieces together about the mess that is the royal family. It's actually quite a long chapter. I think it could be a short story almost in its own right. As they're about to go on this shooting trip, Harry is still trying to think about how he's gonna ask his grandmother and whether he should kind of communicate this to other members of the family. He says that he decides against telling the rest of his family that he's going to ask his grandmother for a couple of reasons. One is he believes that most likely they already kind of know that it's coming. He states specifically that Willie had told him specifically that he thought it was a bad idea to marry Megan, or at least to marry her now. He says it's too fast. Now keep in mind, they've been together, I wanna say about a year at this point, but again, the law, the rules dictate, you gotta be together for at least three years, blah, blah, blah. 
drumbeat of this tradition, following the path, following exactly what's being told of you. Harry notes, in fact, he'd actually been pretty discouraging about my even dating Meg. One day, sitting together in his garden, he'd predicted a host of difficulties I could expect if I hooked up with an American actress, a phrase he always managed to make sound like convicted felon. Are you sure about her, Harold? I am, Willie. But do you know how difficult it's going to be? What do you want me to do? Fall out of love with her? Now, thinking about how everything went down, it's hard not to interpret that third line there as a veiled threat, right? But do you know how difficult it's going to be? What part of being with Megan would be difficult? Let's, let's put our thinking caps on, okay? Which part of being with Megan is the difficult part? The difficult part is the way that she's being treated and harassed by the press, which we know that the family has, plays an active role in. That as much as they wanna claim that they have no influence on the media, we know that's bullshit, right? And so the line, do you know how difficult it's going to be, sounds like a threat from the family, right? It sounds like the family is saying, Megan's gonna get a lot of harassment from the press and we're gonna do nothing about it. That's a nice relationship you got there. Be a shame if anyone, I don't know. Actively destroyed it? Would be a shame if something happened to it. You know, like if we published a bunch of disinformation campaigns. That would be a real shame if something happened to it, huh? We also got a little bit of a glimpse when Harry starts talking to his father. As they're driving, out through the countryside, Charles asks Harry, like, how's Megan doing? So he's like, she's good. Then he says, does she want to carry on working? Say again? Does she want to keep on acting? Oh, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't think so. I expect she'll want to be with me doing the job, you know, which would rule out suits since they film in Toronto. Hmm, I see. Well, darling boy, you know, there's not enough money to go around. I stared. What was he banging on about? He explained, or tried to. I can't pay for anyone else. I'm already having to pay for your brother and Catherine. Now, this, this is another very eye-opening conversation. My first note is Charles asking Harry if Megan is gonna continue acting. This question could not have been asked in good faith if Charles is expecting that Harry is about to ask Meghan to marry him, right? If Harry is interested in marrying Meghan, how could Meghan carry on acting in suits? How would that make, how would that make sense? How would that be possible, right? Like, does she want to carry on working? The British family, the British royal family has made pretty clear that you can't have a day job. That's the one thing that the British royal family is really bad at modernizing on. The Danish royal family, go on, be a model, do it, go wild. Spanish royal family, they have no problem with you having a day job. The British royal family, your job is being royal. That's been made pretty clear throughout Harry and William's whole life. There's no way that Prince Charles asked that in good faith because if he knows that Harry and Meghan are potentially going to get married, Meghan is gonna to have to quit her day job, like obviously. So if he wanted to ask this in good faith, it wouldn't it make more sense for Charles to ask something like, how does Meghan feel like about potentially having to give up her job? Like, I know that you guys are getting very serious. I know, you know, you guys are potentially gonna get married together. Like, how is she feeling about, you know, moving on with her career or giving up acting? That would have been a good faith question. This question seems like a, again, way to try to manipulate Harry into giving up the idea by maybe making him feel guilty that she has to give up her career. And then it leads into this part about there is not enough money to go around. Now you might be asking, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> What 
fuck is Prince Charles talking about? If you don't know the basics of the royal family finances, the royal family is worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. They rake in money not only from the taxpayers, but also from all their secret offshore bank accounts, all of the land that they own, possessions, all of the things that they own as assets. I know those those aren't liquid assets, but like in terms of the actual cash of the royal family, they're worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. So is Charles saying in this moment, you can't get married because I can't provide any money for your new spouse. And he's telling this to Harry right before he's about to ask his grandmother whether he can marry Meghan. If this were the case, if this were the case that they were running out of money and Harry basically had no financial way of marrying anybody, why would this come up now? Why would this come up now in this moment? Wouldn't that be something that would be communicated to Harry before he was like, you know, 36 years old? Wouldn't that be something that would be communicated to Harry any time that he dated anyone? Any time that it seemed that he might get serious with someone? Wouldn't there be a point where they would pull him aside and say, by the way, just so you know, you're not allowed to get married because we don't have any money? Wouldn't that have come up? So it seems a little bit suspicious, okay? Harry writes, Pa didn't financially support Willie and me and our families out of any largesse. That was his job. That was the whole deal. We agreed to serve the monarch, go wherever we were sent, do whatever we were told, surrender our autonomy, keep our hands and feet inside the gilded cage at all times, and in exchange, the keepers of the cage agreed to feed and clothe us. Was Pa, with all of his millions from the hugely lucrative Duchy of Cornwall, trying to say that our captivity was starting to cost him a bit too much? Besides which, how much could it possibly cost to house and feed Meg? So a lot of, a lot of key points here. One, because the royal family has discouraged its members from having real jobs, right? Harry could have, if he was given the opportunity, Harry could have gone to university, gotten a degree, made his own way, had his own income, become financially independent. He could have very well done all that if back when he was a teenager, his father didn't like force him to do one specific career. That could have very well happened. That could have happened for both Harry and William and Charles and everybody in the royal family. They could have been encouraged to find some way to, to make an income. They were actively discouraged from doing that. If your family, especially your parent, if your parent actively discourages you from making your own money and says, if you perform all of these royal duties that you don't get a say in, if you do all the things that we tell you to do, we will support you financially for the rest of your life. Then it's a little bit shady to kind of back out of that deal, right? You've told this person consistently, you don't get to make your own career decisions. You don't get to make money. Back when we were talking about the court circular, William and Harry aren't even in control as to how many engagements they do and how the press reacts to that. Like they don't, they're not even in control of how they perform their royal duties. To have their whole life controlled in this way, to be told that they're not willing to give you a little bit more so that your wife can eat sounds sus. It sounds pretty sus. So here, here's where the cracks are starting to form. Now that Harry is inching closer and closer to asking his grandmother for permission to marry Meghan, the more and more the family is trying to scare Harry out of it. If you go through with this decision to marry Meghan, I will stop providing you the financial support that I said that I was going to provide for you. Those abusive tendencies in William and Charles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger 
as we lead to Megan actually becoming an integral part of the family. We also have a great little tidbit here where they talk about how when William and Kate got married, Charles and Camilla tried to convince Kate to change the spelling of her given Christian name, Catherine, which has always been spelled with a C, <laughs> it's, it's her actual name, to with a K because Camilla and Charles already have C as their name and they didn't want another person with the letter C in their name so that they could have a super special royal cipher. Is it worth it? Is this royal cipher worth it? Like this is the true meaning of why monarchy is bad, right? Because it creates assholes like this. Can you imagine telling someone to change their name just because you have such a big ego that you want your super special seal? Man, these guys are so stupid. I, fu I cannot, I cannot understand this. So Harry aptly comes to the realization that what is really concerning his father is that somebody new is gonna come into the family and possibly dominate the monarchy right? That they're going to steal the spotlight, that they're going to get more press coverage, that him and Camilla might become overshadowed again by this shiny new person coming in, and that they'd already gone through that once, and they really didn't want to go through it again. And so it's all about their image, not wanting to have other people steal their precious spotlight, which ties back to that little anecdote that we got about William and Kate and some of the other anecdotes that we've gotten in earlier sections of the book that show that Charles and Camilla put William and Kate through a lot of fucking hell because they couldn't bear the idea that Kate, as a young, attractive woman, took away even just a little bit of their coverage, of their press coverage. These people are disgusting. <laughs> oh God, I, I shouldn't be too mean. But anyway, Harry is like, let's ignore all this petty drama and stuff, okay? I gotta get Granny alone so that I can ask her whether I can marry Megan or not. Like, Harry is a little bit smart here. He's like, my brother can try to intimidate me, my father can try to intimidate me, but at the end of the day, those bitches have no power, okay? They just petty ass bitches. They can say what they wanna say, but Granny is the actual keeper of the keys here. So he's trying to focus, try to find an in to talk to his grandmother. She seems to be just constantly encircled by other people, so he doesn't really get a good opportunity while they're out there trying to shoot. As he is about to approach her, he realizes, oh, snap! Oh, snap! if Granny says no, What's gonna happen? If the queen says no, this, it's game over. And so I think that gets him a little bit more nervous. He realizes that he had heard some reports coming out in the press from sources in the palace that some in the family didn't quite like Meg, didn't quite approve of her. And so that starts to get a little him a little bit nervous because then he realizes if there's all these men in little gray suits telling that to the press. Maybe those men in little gray suits can get to the queen and convince her to say no. He also mentions that there have been a couple of comments going around about Meghan's race within the royal family. Now keep in mind, he has pointed out the racism of the press, but he has not specifically mentioned the idea of royal family members or people who are in the firm being racist. But we see here, he actually says, concern had been expressed in certain corners about whether or not Britain was ready, whatever that meant. And so if anyone was able to get to the queen and convince her that Britain wasn't quite ready for a black royal family member because all these people are racist as fuck, watch my other video, then this could also put a kibosh on the whole thing as well. We can see the tension definitely mounting on Harry here. Harry is just trying to ask a woman to marry him. A woman that he loves, who seems like a great person. Seems like she's kind to everybody. People like her, but suddenly the idea of her coming in has got everybody all in a fucking tizzy and Harry's starting to realize everybody seems to be 
actively working against me, and these people are my own flesh and blood. People making the argument that Meghan is the reason why Harry won to leave the royal family, that like Meghan somehow manipulated it into him. Like, read this chapter. Literally everybody that's supposed to be supportive of him and be happy for him is literally being a fucking asshole. Literally, they're all of them. It's like reading like a fucking White Lotus episode. Why? <laughs> He reflects back on the part two of the book where he talked about how he always had to get these permission requests while he was in the army to fire upon the enemy, for example. And he talks about his life. He just thinks about his life has been an endless series of permission requests. Is it okay if I do this with my life? If I choose this career path? If I wear this, if I do that, everything in his life is permission requests. It's leading up to this sort of one final permission request, this permission to marry Megan. So again, we're seeing that build up of all the people in his life that are supposed to support him, literally not supporting him in this moment that should be a moment of joy and happiness for Harry, but also coming to the realization, why am I a grown ass man having to ask all of these people for permission when really all that really matters here is I love this woman. I think that understanding is the true unraveling of Harry wanting to be a part of this institution. It would be it would be it for me for certain. I think he this chapter does a really good job of understanding where the rift is gonna come from, why this rift is not Harry's fault, why this is really the royal family being assholes, and where all the sort of drama is gonna come later on. So now the moment of truth, he finally gets the queen alone. Granny, you know I love Meg very much, and I've decided that I would like to ask her to marry me, and I've been told that, er, uh, that I have to ask your permission before I can propose. You have to? Um, well, yes, that's what your staff tell me, and my staff as well, that I have to ask your permission. I stood completely still, as motionless as the birds in my hand. I stared at her face, but it was unreadable. At last she replied, well then, I suppose I have to say yes. I squinted. You feel you have to say yes? Does that mean you are saying yes, but that you want to say no? I didn't get it. Was she being sarcastic, ironic, deliberately cryptic? Was she indulging in a bit of wordplay? I'd never known Granny to do any wordplay, and this would be a surpassingly bizarre moment, not to mention wildly inconvenient for her to start, but maybe she just saw the chance to play off my unfortunate use of the word half and couldn't resist. Or else perhaps there was some hidden meaning beneath the wordplay some message I wasn't comprehending. <laughs>